Welcome to Pick 6 Movies and the very first episode of this new year. A time for looking at the mess you made of your life last year and vowing that this year you'll try to do better. But let's be honest, you're going to be the same wonderful sack of weirdness you've always been and that's why we love you. Who is this we of which I speak? Why, it's none other than my co-host, Mr. Bo Ransdell, and me, Chad Cooper. We're the two voices that'll fill your ear holes for the next couple of hours as we discuss the movie that's episode two of this season's theme, Stream On, featuring six movies that were made specifically for streaming services. And today, we have a real movie for you. It's got actors and dialogue and music in some parts, and there's characters who face challenges and they learn life lessons. And the theme is probably something like, no man is an island. And uh, what else can I tell you about this movie that's the focus of this episode too? Um, it's probably in color and um, most likely English is the, uh, the primary language. And um, I gotta be honest, I don't know what movie we're doing this episode because I'm recording this show open back at the end of last year before we even recorded the first episode of this season. Everything's all out of order. It's like a Tarantino movie or that last season of Arrested Development that was made for Netflix. Hold on a second. Alan, our sound tech, is holding up a piece of paper in the booth that says, check your text message. Hold on, I gotta check my text messages. Okay. Oh, here we go. This is episode two featuring the movie Bright, an urban fantasy film. Are you shitting me? Oh my God. That takes place in an alternate present day where humans, orcs, Jesus Christ, and elves and fairies have been coexisting since the beginning of time. Are you serious? That's our second episode? Two police officers, one human, Will Smith, and the other an orc, Joel Edgerton, God, God. Embark on a routine night patrol that will alter the future of the world as we know it. <laughs> I'm sure that it will. All right, well, this is the part of the episode where the person who picked this movie, which is Mr. Bo Ransdell, shares some insights on how and why this movie got made. I'll be back later to discuss this after Bo wraps everything up. Alan, do you know what genre of movie I loathe? That's right, it's fantasy. No, it doesn't make it any better that it's urban fantasy. What is adult urban fantasy? It's... Put your phone closer up to the glass. Oh my God, does your wife know you look at stuff like that on your phone? <laughs> Whoa, that's your wife? That's you in the monster costume? What's a golem? You know what, don't tell me, I don't care. Get Bo in here to do his intro. I'm gonna go pour bleach in my eyes and try to get the image of you and your wife out of my head. Also, send me a link to that video. I want to see what happens after that. <laughs> Alan, you're weird. That's why we love you. Bo, do your thing. I hold you responsible for this episode. Sometimes on this show, we select movies based on personal preference or some relationship we have with a movie from years before. Sometimes it's a movie that sounds too good to be true, which in the case of pick six movie selections means it's almost too bad to be true. And then when the moon is right and the stars align, I get to pick a movie scientifically tested to challenge the willpower of my co-host. See, Chad hates fantasy movies and novels, and this movie and the preceding introduction may just break him. Let's find out. This episode's film is Bright, a Netflix original starring Joel Edgerton and Will Smith as an orc and his human partner, respectively. It is part of a long line of books and movies that fuse fantasy worlds in the contemporary and familiar world around us, but as a genre, urban fantasy as it's called, hasn't been with us for more than about 40 years. There is a long tradition of science fiction and fantasy in literature. You can go all the way back to Mary Shelley and her living corpse and Jules Verne with his tales of Nemo and undersea adventures. At their time, these would be considered works of romanticism. No, not the smoochy, hand-under-the-sweater kinds of romance, but the literary kind. In that sense, romance is just another word for heightened emotions or situations, something that is not strictly realistic. By this definition, Mary Shelley and Bram Stoker and Edgar Allan Poe were all romantic writers. Romance, in this context, was very popular. 
American Romanticism lagged behind the rise and fall of its European cousin, but the reason we have Melville and Hawthorne and all those great 19th century American writers is because they were doing their riffs on the European Romanticism of the previous decades. And then came writers like Jack London and Kate Chopin, and others working in the late 1800s and early 1900s, writers who had yet to stare into the horrific maw of World War I, and these writers were concerned with realism in their work. They wanted to accurately portray what life was like. Their protagonists were often poor, often forced to make it by their wits, and in so doing, shine a light on the difficulty of making it in the world without the romantic notions of vampires or ghosts or unrequited love among aristocrats. And then in the mid-1900s, there was a fascinating fusion of these ideas. What if you took the literary romanticism of Verne and coupled it with the realism of Jack London? Could the absurd and the fantastical sit alongside the real and the contemporary? Turns out, yes it could. And suddenly, a new wave of science fiction crashed onto American letters. Writers like Isaac Asimov and John W. Campbell set their sci-fi stories in as realistic a world as they can muster, and this would add believability to the genre work. In the early 1960s, Ray Bradbury published the dark fantasy novel Something Wicked This Way Comes. Aside from it being a truly phenomenal piece of writing, it was a touchstone for writers to follow like Neil Gaiman and R.L. Stein, and perhaps most importantly, Stephen King, who would often cite Bradbury as one of his biggest influences. And one of those influences was Bradbury's ability to create a real world with believable characters and then give it an authorial nudge, just enough to spin that believable world on its axis and make it just as natural for his straw-haired protagonists to play baseball as it was to go up against evil circus ringmasters. And Stephen King internalized that in a big bad way. We've done whole seasons on movies based on the works of Stephen King, but you have to stop yourself now and again and remember that we live in a world where the best-selling horror author of all time is still alive and writing in our lifetime. That's crazy. Anyways, when he published Carrie in 1973, Stephen King hit a mother load. His writing style was easy and welcoming, filled with cozy aphorisms and characters that loved their dialects and monologues. And his protagonists, often writers, were never rich or at least not too rich. They were normal people with normal problems. Alcoholic fathers, children isolated by their innocence from the world of adults, old cops looking to make some kind of sense of retirement, good people, or maybe just people trying to be good, going about the business of living. And then the supernatural and the horrific would crash the party. A doctor finds a local burial ground that can bring back his deceased infant son. A writer finds himself battling his own childhood and a plague of vampirism on his return to his childhood hometown. A young boy must save his mother from terminal cancer by journeying across a nightmare mirror version of America. All relatable people in extraordinary circumstances. And he sold over 400 million copies of his books by making his characters so relatable and their situations so horrific. While this is not precisely urban fantasy, it begins to get at what makes urban fantasy unique. The realism is the key. Terry Windling is largely credited with the first true urban fantasy work with Borderland in 1986, an anthology that was all about a fictional city placed between the world of the Elflands and the real world. Writers like Charles DeLint and Emma Bull followed. They often employed young and savvy protagonists, and much of the early days of urban fantasy would be played in the fields of young adult literature. Urban fantasy would bend toward the dark with writers like Laurel K. Hamilton, whose Anita Blake stories of a female police consultant and zombie razor running afoul of vampires and all manner of supernatural creatures is immensely popular. There is a heavy element of crime procedural in these books, as there is with Jim Butcher's Dresden Files, which owe some of their existence to works like The Night Stalker from the 1970s and the noir fiction of the 1940s. I found a handy list of characteristics of urban fantasy to help determine if the thing you are reading or watching is in fact urban fantasy. First, are there fantasy tropes in your realistic setting? Does a unicorn pop up in Minneapolis to stall traffic? Is there a vampire serving as a bouncer for the hip new club in New Orleans? Well, you might just have yourself an urban fantasy. Two, 
Are you in an urban setting? And not just urban, but a biggish city. If you're dealing with trolls in Des Moines, Iowa, that is fringe urban fantasy at best. We're talking New York and Chicago and LA and the Big Easy, not fart knuckle Arkansas. If there is a subway system in your city being ridden by orcs, you might be reading an urban fantasy novel. Three, what about magic? There are supernatural elements or fairies or some sort of mythology involved if you are reading urban fantasy. If you have an honest-to-goodness, wand-wielding witch in your book who pops into a Starbucks for a latte, you might be reading an urban fantasy book. Fourth, is there some kind of noir or police influence? Most of these books will include a private investigator or some kind of crime-solving element. If your detective bends down to a body and says, Just what I thought, gored by a minotaur, you might be reading an urban fantasy novel. Fifth, are there mythical creatures in your book? Vampires, werewolves, mermaids, gnomes, all of these might find a home in these kinds of books. If your private eye has a zombie partner, you might be reading an urban fantasy novel. Number six on our list of urban fantasy tropes, does the protagonist have a foot in both the real world and the supernatural world? Is your private eye character troubled because her father was an elf and her mother was a human and that makes solving elf crimes harder? Well, then you might be reading an urban fantasy novel. And finally, is your protagonist young and cool and probably attractive? Most of these books include someone hip and exciting to follow through the works. If your main character is a young boy who just learned he can wield magic and he has to save Pittsburgh from a demon lord, you might be reading an urban fantasy novel. And one quick divergence. Authors of urban fantasy are quick to point out that urban fantasy is distinct from paranormal romance, which is an equally popular genre of fiction. The difference, urban fantasy writers will say, is that the focus in urban fantasy is on the characters and adventure, and the romance part is key to the paranormal romance stories. Basically, if you can take the romance out of the plot and still have a book, it's urban fantasy. If the romance is too central to the tale, it's paranormal romance. There, now you know. And for all the defining, urban fantasy is a diverse and incredibly popular genre of fiction. If you count the Harry Potter series and its ranks, and there's no reason not to, it's also one of the most profitable. A quick glance at Amazon Kindle's top 100 books will give you a dozen or more examples of urban fantasy and paranormal romance, the kissing cousins of fantasy literature, and it has quietly become one of the biggest literary movements of the past 40 years. But what about TV and movies? Where's all the urban fantasy there? Well, it's around. The very popular and influential series Buffy the Vampire Slayer is absolutely urban fantasy. And despite the complicated history of Joss Whedon, it's still one of my favorites, too. There's Highlander, both the movie, which rules, and the TV show, which I assume is a pale imitation, but I've never seen it. There's the vampire series Kindred the Embraced and Beauty and the Beast with Ron Perlman and Grimm and the wildly successful Supernatural series. But movies, not so much. Fantasy movies have always had a rough go of things in the theater for some reason. The exception proving the rule is the Lord of the Rings series, which was highly anticipated and brilliantly executed by a very good director, Peter Jackson. But by the time he got to the Hobbit movies, there were already diminishing returns and a cooling of interest. Highlander was a cult hit, but its sequels performed poorly. The latest attempt to bring Hellboy to the big screen was a real dud, and Vin Diesel's The Last Witch Hunter was received poorly by audiences and critics alike. The only real hit I can think of is The Crow, which was bolstered by the unfortunate death of its star, Brandon Lee. Still, it's an awesome movie, and I kind of want to watch that now instead of finishing this introduction. I am oddly intrigued by the recent spate of direct to streaming fantasy movies, and yes, this is not urban fantasy and this is a total digression, but did you know they keep making these things? I am absolutely obsessed with a company called Aerostorm that makes cheap direct to video fantasy movies with C list stars. The Mythica series, five movies if you can believe that, is their crown jewel, but they've also done one called Orc Wars and one simply called Orcs, Orcs, Orcs that I can't believe I haven't seen. Oh, and there's Curse of the Dragon Slayer. And that's just Aerostorm. There's a ton of these things out there like Dragonite, or Ancestral World, or Dragon Soldiers, or Dragon Fury, or Guardians of Time. There's clearly an audience for these movies, just not a good example of one to hit the theaters and bring in a big crowd that isn't also called Lord of the Rings. And in many ways, that brings us to Bright, the actual movie we're talking about on this episode. 
Bright was written by Max Landis, son of John Landis, and all-around creep. He was one of the popularizers of the term Mary Sue when discussing female protagonists who are empowered, like Rey specifically in the new Star Wars trilogy. He was also credibly accused of sexual assault and abuse by no less than eight women, so that's why you don't see his name on credits much anymore. But before he was outed as a horrible human being, he was rising through the Hollywood ranks on his own merits and certainly not those of his father who was a major player from back in the day. His scripts for Victor Frankenstein and American Ultra were generally panned, but that didn't stop him from getting more work as executive producer of shows like Channel Zero, and of course, he wrote Bright. David Iyer was attached to the script for Bright, and he is no stranger to this show. He was the guy who wrote and directed Suicide Squad, that miserable piece of cinematic garbage. He also directed and wrote End of Watch, which I like, and then Sabotage and Fury, which are both pretty middling affairs but he was a reasonable pick for Bright, having done gritty cop movies and more fantastical films like Suicide Squad. Will Smith, who we'll get to in a minute, was signed on with Joel Edgerton, and somewhere along the line, Numi Rapace was brought in for the villainous Layla in this movie. You might know her from the original Girl with the Dragon Tattoo movies, or maybe Prometheus, or Lamb if you're a weirdo like me, in which she adopts a half-human, half-lamb baby. It's pretty good. Well, maybe not good, but it's super weird. Anyway, Joel Edgerton is a solid actor and filmmaker, and his movie The Gift is really good. He also turned in good performances with It Comes at Night and The Green Knight, and he's been Uncle Owen and all the new Star Wars stuff, if that's your thing. The cast is rounded out by Lucy Fry as Tika, who you wouldn't know from anything credible, and then a bunch of character actors like Margaret Cho as the captain and Happy Anderson as the human-fed Montague, unless we forget Ike Barinholtz as the racist cop on the force. You would know him from Neighbors or The Disaster Artist or about a million TV appearances. Netflix snagged the rights to this package of script, director, and stars for about $90 million, which made it the most expensive movie Netflix made up to that time. And when it was finally aired, Netflix said it racked up about 11 million views. Shockingly, fan sites started spewing love for the movie, maybe because of the dearth of urban fantasy content in films we talked about earlier. If you live in a desert, you'll drink the sand. Critics were far less kind. David Ehrlich of IndieWire said it was one of the worst movies of 2017, stating, quote, There's boring, there's bad, and then there's bright. Most of the criticism revolved around the odd blend of fantasy and reality and the painfully on-the-nose commentary that left nothing to subtlety. Still, Netflix said you can make fun of bright all you want. The movie was beloved by some. I happen to live with one of them, as a matter of fact, and there were people who were genuinely clamoring for a sequel to this thing, and Netflix seemed poised to make it. And then came the Oscars of 2022. You may have heard the news that Will Smith walked onto the Oscar stage and smacked well-known comedian Chris Rock. In the wake of that, Netflix canceled Bright 2. But, lest we think it was entirely because of the smack in front of a billion or so people, it's worth noting that Netflix was also in the midst of restructuring. With the number of streaming channels out there growing, it was becoming harder to gain new subscribers and retain the ones you had. So, Netflix was in a sweep of cancellations at the same time. And also, maybe someone pointed out that Bright cost a whole lot of money and wasn't all that well received. Blame it on any of those reasons, or all of those reasons. Most likely, it's a little bit of everything that sealed the unfortunate fate of Bright 2. But now... It is time to turn our attention away from idle speculation and hop in the car with Chad for a ride along through the orc-filled streets of L.A. Ladies and gentlemen, orcs and elves, it's 2017's Bright. And welcome back to another episode of Pick 6 Movies. This season, of course, being Stream On, a play on the title uh, of a failed HBO television series. I was thinking it was the Aerosmith, Dream On. Oh, I was thinking of the one with Brian Ben-Ben. That wasn't very good. No. It was better than Arliss. Remember that? Oh, I do remember. <laughs> I, I don't know that I ever watched an episode of Arliss. I think I watched like half an episode of, Ar- of Arliss. I was like, oh, this is not for me. And, but I, then again, I think everyone who watched Arliss thought the same thing, <laughs> except for maybe Robert Wool. But I am Bo. With me as ever 
we're uh, talking about Arliss, you know, like the kids do, is the young and hip Chad. Hello. And we are talking about uh, a, a movie called Bright, <laughs> which is an urban fantasy film from 2017, as you heard in the introduction. Which, according to that introduction, you sounded upset that they aren't making a sequel to this thing. I am not upset about it. My girlfriend is, is not upset. The, the way she put it was, like, my world is not a worse place for there not being a Bright 2. But if they made a Bright 2, I would totally watch it. My world's a better place because I know it's not coming. Like I said, this movie is like scientifically created in a lab to be a thing that Chad would not like. Give it time. They just released a sequel to R.I.P.D. with different actors, you know? Hope Springs Eternal, give it five, six years. There might be a bright two starring that guy from the Avengers who didn't really ever make it as a lead character. So they just gave him bright two. Are you talking about Jeremy Renner? I'm just talking about any of them. Okay, fair enough. I just <laughs> saw in the newspaper today that he was involved in some kind of snowplow accident and was, was seriously injured. I was like, oh man. <laughs> was he driving it? I don't know. I didn't read that far into it because I was just like, oh man, Hawkeye got plowed and then the mr plow song from the simpsons ran through my head and then i got right. distracted and ate a toaster strudel this is not the worst movie we've ever reviewed Bo. oh no, it, no, no 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 i like i there are things about this movie that i not necessarily like but i can appreciate <laughs> i i don't think it's well cast is is my biggest problem i think joel edgerton is fine i think will smith is wrong for this movie I think there are things that could have been done to this movie to make it better. So just getting ahead of myself on this, mm -hmm. if you had written this film to where Will Smith's character has his, the tragic beginning, mm -hmm. and then you pair him up with the make the buddy cop, and you make Will Smith kind of the more of the fish out of water being assimilated into this other culture. Again, it kind of take more of a page from like training day in a way mm -hmm. of pairing these two things together and let that be the clash. And this, everything's mismatched up. Like Will Smith's character, Nick the Orc, sometimes they're serious, sometimes they're funny, sometimes they're sympathy inducing but then turn the page and they're suddenly like the goofball comic relief yeah. and so it's it's a real odd soup of characters and plot and background and stuff that i just don't care about again this was a discussion i was having with my girlfriend about like why don't urban fantasy movies work in general and the conclusion we reach, and I think it's probably, if not true, close to being true. They're not very good. It's that you have to do so much world building that to do the world building properly and also serve the characters well, you need long form. You need a series of novels or a television series or something like that where you can kind of start small and build and build and build as opposed to something like this where you're like, oh, okay, I guess orcs are there. Oh, there are elves too. Oh, wait, there are dragons flying around. There's a centaur cup. What are the rules of all this? But then don't set it in the real, real world. Set it in a world that is familiar but doesn't have to adhere to the disruption it doesn't have to adhere to the rules that uh, you and I know yeah. with the injection of this fantasy element. A good example of how this was a good example, a, an example of how <laughs> this was done is in the animated film Upward, which has more in common with Shrek in a way that it takes things from the world as we know it and then gives it a little funky fairy tale twist bow. But this movie seems to skew the other direction where let's make it 80% real world, 20% make them up fantasy nonsense and meshing those two together. It begs more questions than it gives answers. And I've got a whole lot of questions. I think that something that works in this genre, I mentioned in the introduction, but something like Highlander where it's like, okay, this is the real world only in this world there are these immortal dudes that run around and every so often hack off each other's heads during this quickening event mm -hmm. and then that's the fantasy element you know there's a singular fantasy element in the real world as opposed to like you said it's 80 percent real world 20 percent. oh i gotta go outside and kill a fairy with my broom 
Yeah. <laughs> when I, before I ever saw this movie, I'll say this. I thought that it was going to be like, oh, there was some magic portal or something that opened up. No. And a bunch of fantasy creatures spewed forth. But the, no. the presumption of this movie that it kind of took me a few minutes to get around to is that these creatures have just always been there. Like there was apparently no Jesus. Oh, I think that there was a Jesus. You think so? Because they yeah. don't really mention a Jesus. Well, because it takes place in the summertime. They only really talk about Jesus when it's Christmas oh, or Easter. Fair enough. <laughs> but but then that presumes that like Jesus was fighting orcs and elves and whatnot. Texas asked for its independence because they talk about the Alamo. There are a couple of things where I'm like, that would exist in this world. Like if you no, were... it wouldn't. It wouldn't at all. Yeah. And it wouldn't. Also, this movie feels like it was made to be extreme ADA compliant because this is the first movie that I feel was made for blind people with its nonstop description of what's happening in the movie while it's happening. <laughs> it reminds me of that Scooby Doo Where Are You first season where everything that happened in that cartoon, Fred or Daphne or Thelma is just saying out loud what you're watching on the screen. Well, that's not bad. Sometimes I get confused, Chad. You don't have to watch any of this and you'll know what's going on. Also, the use of the word fuck in this movie, I looked up the script uh, written by Max Landis. Mm -hmm. Good God. In the script, there are 138 instances of the F word. Mm -hmm. I don't like to say it too much, but my grandmother might be listening. You're, and yeah <laughs> from beyond yes ghosts are a big segment of our listening audience by the way mm -hmm. it feels out of place i agree in in this movie i would almost think that it would have been more entertaining to use a make -em up curse word do you do what they did in battlestar galactica or something where they just use frack instead of fuck it's just it's skewed a little different i get what you're doing and then we'll go from there i also really went into this movie as you know expecting to dislike it and i did because mm -hmm. It's terrible. But my dislike of the movie was for reasons that I didn't anticipate. I really thought we were going to lean more heavy on elves and magic. And as I mentioned earlier, it really focuses more on the gritty cop drama over the spells and abracadabraisms. I don't know if you caught this, Chad, but it's a bit of an allegory mm, about really? racism and, and an underclass of los angeles this movie after having watched it it felt like a misguided downloadable story mode for grand theft auto like somebody <laughs> at rockstar games came in and said hey remember how we did that zombie version of red dead redemption well what if we take world of warcraft and we put it in to gta's los santos yeah and they're like that's money baby let's make that happen and this is what gets shat out it does have that kind of edgelord gta feel to it of like we're gonna be extreme and i think you're right like i think the tone is all over the place that's one of the big problems with it is that sometimes they're funny buddy cops sometimes it's super serious and sometimes it is going for this kind of hardcore dark vibe and it's like you should play this lighter also will smith is a complete asshole in this uh-huh he's doing the will smith show i mean it's the fresh prince oh my god it's, it's like what you expect to see in a will smith movie but his character is completely unlikable from the first moment we meet him he's just a dick he's an awful person and admits it later in the movie but he never becomes a good person like he never turns the corner no and he keeps throwing that will smith charm around like i said he's totally wrong for this you need to decide what the characters are he's too old for this but like a de niro type it's, it's the midnight run thing right like you get robert de niro as the straight man oh my god and then you get your orc is charles groden who is the comic relief <laughs> No, no, you're not doing any of that. I think you get the orc as the straight man and you have the human cop that's put together with him and you could you could make that work. I think Will Smith could have made this work if he had not played the heavy in this, but we'll get to it. Let's kick things off. So we start with a quote from The Great Prophecy, Chad. Prophecy 715. Uh-huh. That goes, mm -hmm. only a bright can control the power of a wand. Mm -hmm. And Bo, did you know that with great power comes great responsibility? 
Oh, is that so? They say only a bright can control the power of a wand no less than 10 times in this movie. Let me ask you this, and spoilers for Bright if you've never seen it. At what point did you realize that Will Smith was going to be a bright? Because for me, it was right here. You're better at this than me. For me, the moment that I knew that he was... Well, I don't know when I figured out what a bright was, because I really wasn't paying attention. I mean, I was... Even two times through, like, I, I kind of paid attention one and a half times. At the obvious moment, when that grizzled up vomiting homeless sword wielding maniac in the cab says this here fella he's special and i was yeah, like oh okay. okay all right for me it was as soon as the i saw the words <laughs> only a bright can control one i was like oh okay so will smith then we get this soulful tragic song called broken people uh-huh. From the soundtrack of the hit movie Bright, starring Will Smith. Uh-huh. And we get these shots of Los Angeles, which is important. It is Los Angeles, but not the Los Angeles we know. This Los Angeles is set in present day, but it's interwoven with normal people like you and me, Bo. But as we mentioned earlier, there's all these elves and orcs and fairies. And those are the three groups of others in this movie. We do see a flying dragon at one mm-hmm. point, but there are no giants or witches or goblins or elves or wizards. Just... Right. There's a fairies. centaur. No, wait. There, wait, there are elves. Yeah. Wait, there's a centaur? Where? I'll point it out when we get there. But yes, there is a centaur in this movie. There are fairies. There are elves. They mention dwarves, but they're never seen. Hey, 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 little people. Right, sorry. When you see the orcs, they're all like in hoodies, they're spray painting walls and tagging convenience stores and stuff. And it's like, oh, so orcs are black people. Got it, Bright. Because that's 100% what's happening in this movie. There's spray-painted graffiti of orcs with one fist raised. There's graffiti of orcs shooting cops and, like, messaging against police brutality. Drinking 40s. Yeah. It's stuff like that. (laughs) It's it's so overblown and over the top. You're like, I get it. You don't have to do this. But then the movie shows us shots of the real-life homeless problem in Los Angeles. Mm Mm-hmm. And you're like, wait, what? And then we see all of the elves. Elf town, They're the rich assholes oppressing uh, humans and even more so orcs. And in all their graffiti, as you mentioned, the orcs are the bottom of the societal chain of existence. And then the movie slows down to show an off-ramp of the 405 to the elf district. Mm -hmm. And we see the iconic brown triangle Beverly Hills sign, but it's now written in some elf language and says elves only. (laughs) It's real dumb. That's all the world building that this movie bothers to do they do mention in the graffiti there's comments about the shield of light and then there's a bunch of graffiti about the dark overlord returning which none of this matters Bo, at all no not really another problem with the movie is that they definitely expected for there to be a bright two and three because all this dark lord stuff just is not commented on here's a bright idea make a movie that's just a standalone movie Right. That opens doors to a part two or part three if you are so emboldened to do that. But it needs to be its own thing. You need to do a Star Wars before you do an Empire Strikes Back. Right. So we meet Will Smith, Uh who's playing a police officer, as he's done in multiple movies. And he's uh, chilling by his cop car when his police officer partner, Nick the Orc, uh, he's buying some burritos from a street vendor. And he goes, hey, Will Smith, you want green sauce or you want red sauce? And then a different Orc comes walking out of a bodega and pulls up his hoodie. And this other Orc pulls out a shotgun and just blasts Will Smith, but not killing him. Which I hoped was going to be the end of the movie. I was like, oh, this is going to be the shortest one we ever do. (laughs) Can we talk about what the orcs look like just real quick for those people that should have watched this and never, ever will watch it? Yeah, they look like the Lord of the Rings orcs. If you ever saw that, they look like that. Yeah, or they look like the Grammarian guards from Star Wars. Yeah, not quite as piggish as that. Yeah, they're more humans. Yeah. But it looks like they've got a bad case of, what's that skin condition? Is it vitiligo or something like where it blends different hues of pigmentation? Like they don't have scales or anything. And they've got these two pointy teeth coming up from the bottom of their jaw. Mm -hmm. And I think they may have like yellow cat eyes or something. But for the most part, they just look like normal humans, just with different pigmentation. Again, a not so subtle reference to... (laughs) <laughs> African Americans in this country, Chad. Will Smith wakes <laughs> he up. He gets shot. Right. Yeah. yeah. He wakes up. And his nurse or his doctor wife won. Bo, he's got a gun in his bed with him yeah. and a back covered in tattoos. <laughs> you know what? None of that matters. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. And I like the fact that we just totally don't care about her character even a little bit. His wife. His wife. She mm-hmm. is there to be discussed what once. Like, this is the only scene she's really in. 
She gets a phone call later. And she gets a phone call, and then she shows up in the crowd at the end, and that's it. It's a real nothing. I didn't even see her in the crowd. Yeah. Yeah. She's a nurse. Is she a nurse or a doctor? I don't know. Right. (laughs) It's a good question. But, you know, surprise, surprise, Max Landis not writing a woman character very well. I would think she's a nurse because of where they live. Yeah, maybe. Because they don't live in a very good neighborhood. Right, right. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. so she's made coffee for him. And and we get our first like real Will Smithism as he's pulling this piece of paper out of his coffee. He's like, hey, what's this? And she's like, oh, uh, we ran out of coffee filter, so I had to use paper towels. Like, well, this time I'll just eat it. And you're like, oh, okay, so he's going to be Will Smith in this movie. <laughs> I think it's important to mention that Will Smith, if you don't know who he is, welcome back from your coma from the last 30 years. But Will Smith is a black man and his wife in this movie is a white woman. And I only mention this because this movie, as you noted, Bo, is fraught with allegory of racism in the United States without actually dealing with the racism that exists in the United States. It's like racism on top of speciesism on top of abracadabraism. Mm-hmm. Abracadabra is one of the worst of the social ills plaguing us today. Well, it's the number one ism that John Lennon refused to believe in. Mm-hmm. His wife tells him, there's a fairy in the bird feeder. I thought you killed it. And then Will Smith, he's bringing us pure uncut Will Smith to this performance. He tells his wife, he's like, yo, I don't fuck with no fairies. All right. My cousin Day Day, he messed with a fairy and that fairy shit in its own hand and threw it in Day Day's eyes and it swelled up like a cantaloupe and you're just like oh we're gonna get a lot of that in yeah. this movie do what you want with the screenplay make it your own well you're gonna have a good time we're all gonna have a good time on the laptop to just to let you know you're really not gonna have a good time oh my joe God. rogan is there so in this world uh-huh all of the cosmic tumblers fell into place to enable humans orcs elves fairies gregorian guards and whatever the hell else to live together but also it produced a world where the joe rogan experience has come to be in existence Mm -hmm. what's even more believable is that his wife is watching this on her laptop with really focused attention (laughs) right joe rogan's like what's that cop it's an orc it's an lapd police officer what's that all about how's that work and then there's this other orc being interviewed by joe rogan and the orc says he's never been blooded he's not part of the blooded clan he's like a figure that got cut off he's dead to us by the way vaccines don't work and will smith rightfully turns off the joe rogan experience is like you know hey don't watch any of that shit he tells his nurse wife hey i don't want this guy in my car either but i'm five years away from my pension and so i gotta i'm just not rocking the boat what guy in his car we don't know who he's talking about bo who what and so she tells him you know what my biggest fear is will smith is one day i'm gonna be in that emergency room and they're gonna wheel you in they're gonna say doctor or nurse or orderly or perhaps janitorial staff whatever i am Does this man look familiar to you? Oh my God, it's my husband, brother, boyfriend, cousin, nephew. He finally goes outside to deal with this fairy problem that's attacking Uh the bird feeder. And it's, I mean, it's a little tiny insect-like creature that's fluttering around. It's got hands and legs. It's like a bird. It's like a bird, but it's kind of humanoid. His neighbors, there's like 12 or 14 of them. They're all outside on their front lawn in the morning drinking beer and tailgating for the prices right or something. Will Smith, when he comes out, he looks over at his neighbors and he says, today, fairy lives don't matter. And I'm like, just... It's rough. There's a lot of clunkers like that in this movie, but that's the first one where you're like, oh, I don't don't think I like this. Then Will Smith just beats the shit out of this fairy with a broom and his neighbors just drop the N-word left and right. Yeah. And then once this fairy goes to the ground, the main neighbor says, now take it out LAPD style. Mm -hmm. And Will Smith just crushes this fairy with this broom, sending this purplish blue blood squirting across the driveway. Our movie's hero has committed an act of graphic violence within the first seven minutes of this film. As he's going inside, he throws kind of over his shoulder. Y'all just keep doing your gangster shit on the front lawn. I'm just trying to sell my house is all. Why is he selling his house, but why would you put that in the screenplay? I don't know that it was in the screenplay. I think this was just Will Smith, Will Smith ended it up in this movie. There was a scene following this that doesn't matter at all to anything. Much Mm -hmm. like the character of his daughter who he's talking to. It's a whole conversation they have. Because Will Smith says something about like his, his partner being stupid. And his daughter is like... Like, mom says that orcs are dumb and he's like no 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 orcs aren't dumb orcs are just a different race and different races are different nobody's better or worse than the other person 
It's just mm-hmm. different is all. And you're like, okay, I get it. Please don't ever mention this again, Bright, but don't worry. They will mention it a million more times. He says nobody is dumber or smarter. Everybody just wants to get along and have a good life, which a quick tip for aspiring screenwriters. If you're writing a movie that's dealing with race or racial tensions, I would highly recommend staying away from Rodney King's famous can't we all just get along comment. Um, <laughs> yeah. I also think uh, in dealing with a movie about race or a film that is an allegory to race, talking about orc clans a lot and how Nick is not part of the clan, probably shouldn't do that. In fact, I think the only time you should probably be talking about the clan is when it's in reference to Ku and Klux or the cave bear. And that's pretty much it. Yeah. In fact, you know what? Just don't talk about clan at all. Ever. Also, if you're going to address race, maybe the writer or director should be someone more familiar with it than two famous rich white dudes. <laughs> who live in L.A. Yeah, that's my rule of thumb. You know who should write the story of Roe versus Wade? Not two white dudes. You know who should <laughs> tell the story of, of gang life in Los Angeles? Not two rich white dudes. That's my rule of thumb. But that's my bright. You don't think getting Woody Allen and like uh, Paul Haggis together? Yeah. Like, hey, you guys should really work on this. How about a movie that's about sexual abuse and, and racism? Speaking of Paul Haggis, I think the movie Crash is terrible. Yeah. I think Max Landis and Kevin Spacey should team up to do a movie about the safe workplace. <laughs> Maybe that would work. To have Louis C.K. come in to punch up the script. And then the guy walks out and he's masturbating. Like, what? Which, you know what? I had a friend of mine say to me, come on, man. Don't you think Louis C.K. should get a pass? And, and I told him, I was like, I don't think he should. I think Louis C.K. is very funny. But if at my work, I heard about a guy who walked out in front of two female co-workers masturbating, he's immediately on the no list forever. Yeah. I can't go beyond that. It's like, come on, but he's a really funny guy. Like, I'm sure he is. That's insane. Bill Cosby was really funny, too. Should he get a pass for <laughs> doping and raping women? Probably not. <laughs> you know, they say that when he gets out of jail next year, he's going to go on tour. I was like, oh. <laughs> That'll go well. Yeah. They were booing his ass before he even went to jail. Yeah. Before he even went on trial. Remember that? Yeah, People yeah. were buying tickets to just heckle and throw shit at him. Is Bill Cosby's crimes, are his crimes worse than Louis C.K.'s? Probably. But they're in the same ballpark. That's like saying, well, I killed one person. Well, I killed 50. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm Pol Pot. I'm Ted Bundy. <laughs> Speaking of the heavy allegory of this movie, Nick the Orc shows up, who is Will Smith's partner. Mm-hmm. And Will Smith is upset that Nick the Orc has shown up in a police car to pick Will Smith up. And he's just trying to do a nice thing of, hey, I was in the neighborhood. He tells him, Bo, I was at diversity training and your house was on the way to the bar. So I thought I could just stop by and see you. <laughs> like, wait, Nick the Orc, you are the diversity that they're talking about in diversity training. Why are you at diversity training? He's the exhibit A. <laughs> like, he sits in a chair at the front of the class and everyone's like, like huh? <laughs> Nick, Nick, could you come in the room? Oh, no. Oh, hey, everybody. I'm Nick. I'm an orc. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what diversity looks like. Hello. I'm going to the bar later. People in the audience like, ugh, ugh. no, no. Get him. Oh, nope, nope, nope. Wrong, wrong. That's the wrong lesson to be taken. Shoot him. Oh. Nope, nope. Put down the guns. And then he's like, hey, by the way, Will Smith, you just put poop on your yard. And he's like, what are you talking about? I paid a bunch of money for somebody to come out and put fertilizer on my lawn. He's like, yeah, it's human poop. And he's like, oh, shut up. Or Nick the Orc. Yeah. And by the way, don't ever show up in that car, in that uniform to pick me up ever again. Will Smith's daughter runs outside for her second and only real scene in this movie. She comes outside and she says, hey, Nick, we're on our way to Grandma's. And Nick the Orc says, great, I'll give you a ride. I was on my way to the bar to get drunk. And then Will Smith says, this ain't no Uber, man. Shut up. And I was like, wait, so Uber exists uh-huh. in our, our Orc magic world? That's right. Because they say later that elves are rich and they run everything. So like what some elf venture capitalist decided to back Uber. Mm -hmm. That's right. See, I think this is where Will Smith comes in and starts Will Smithing it up and they can't tell him no or edit that out. Right. Yeah. He does this a few times where he throws some pop culture reference and it's like, this does not exist in this world. The daughter, Sophia, is like, don't tell Nick to shut up. 
weren't you just telling me about racial tolerance? <laughs> <laughs> so they end up getting in the car and taking his daughter to her grandmother's. And Will Smith like walks her to the door of the grandmother's apartment, I guess, because we never see the grandmother. So maybe it's just the apartment that they let the little girl have on the side or something. I thought Nick took him there. Because the next scene after he drops her off at Grandma's, which, by the way, give Will Smith a wife or give Will Smith a daughter. He doesn't need both. Also, did he get shot with a shotgun Mm -hmm. not three minutes ago in our movie? Where did he get shot? Clearly it wasn't in the face. Yeah, he seems pretty immune to bullets even later on in this movie. But before she goes into the Grandma's house, uh, or question mark, whatever it is, she's like, I don't want you to die, Will Smith. Mom says Nick the Orc is going to get you killed. (laughs) And he's like, Nick's the orc's not going to get me killed. And then she just shuts the door in his face because he was probably going to make a pop culture reference about thigh masters or something. She was like, I don't want to hear it. Tell your grandma I'm going to Venmo her some money to pay for groceries. So they get back in the car and Nick the orc tells Will Smith, like, hey, you smell like you haven't slept so good, Will Smith. And he's like, yeah, maybe it's because of the nightmares I have about getting shot with a shotgun while you were off getting a burrito. First off, I want to call bullshit on this. If he does say that he wants to start over and start over, and Will Smith cannot let it go that he blames Nick the Orc for getting him shot. But Nick the Orc didn't do anything. Nick just went over to get lunch. Will Smith is standing there with his thumb up his ass and his hand on his phone or something. And this dude just runs out and shoots him. What would Nick have done if he'd been there? Unless Nick... Saying like, hey, we need to stop here to get burritos. What is it? Because of the decision to get lunch. That's what he's lording over him. Nick the Orc points out like, I don't eat cow flesh. I was getting burrito for you. Yeah. But Will Smith being a, a complete jackass in this movie, like you said, won't let it go. And Nick the Orc is like, look, I know you are disappointed in me, Will Smith. And that's the point where Will Smith is like, you know what? Let's just drop this. We're going to hit the reset button. We're not, we're not going to talk about this anymore. Except for the six more times I'm going to bring it up in this movie. Except for the fact that every (laughs) emotional beat in this movie hinges on this. Nick the Orc turns on the radio and it's just this loud metal song. And Will Smith shuts it off. And Nick the Orc is like, hey, what are you doing? That is one of the best love songs ever written. Will Smith is like, that sounded terrible. And I hate it. And he says, you know, Will Smith, I I can smell things and see your face. And your face is someone who has not had enough uh, conjugal love. And maybe you need more sex with your wife. Yeah, he does the finger in the donut motion with his hand because this movie spoon feeds everything to you. People aren't going to know what conjugal love means. And Will Smith is like, oh, you're pretty good at that. How about you give me the, the face of someone who needs pancakes? And Nick the Orc makes a face. He's like, yeah, that, you are you are real good at this. How about you give me the face of an orc who shuts the fuck up and strives to work? And you're like, wow. Completely deflating all of the levity and this playful moment between these two where he tells his partner to shut the fuck up and drive to work. He's like, oh, you're good at this. And then gets mad at him. He's like, what are you doing driving through Elf Town? We're going to get stopped in all the traffic. They don't want us there. Yeah. And he's like, oh, it's a shortcut, Will Smith. <laughs> they end up driving through the Beverly Hills part of, of L.A., the uh, Elf Town here. Yeah. They stop at a light, and Nick the Orc looks over at a chauffeur who is, you know, driving a stretch limo, presumably for an elf, who taps his teeth. As if, because Nick the Orc, worth pointing out, has his teeth shaved down. So he doesn't have the pointy teeth sticking out from his lower jaw. It says they were shaved down, but does that mean that he did it? Or was he just born that way? They don't explain that. I think he does it as like a cosmetic thing, to so that he doesn't look All right. pure Orc. Mm-hmm. Or, they don't really... Also, the only reason you know that that guy's a chauffeur is because they tell you. Will Smith's like, even the chauffeurs are racist or something. Also, all the elves are white. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Of course they are. (laughs) Like lily white, blonde hair. Yeah. (laughs) Call it allegory or just natural casting. I guess. We cut to the police locker room where we see a bunch of racist cops and they're accosting Will Smith for having Nick the Orc as his partner, but he didn't choose this. And then best of all, as you mentioned, is Mad TV's own Ike Barinholtz wearing this hilarious Ned Flanders brand nose cozy mustache. Give the old cookie duster the heave ho. Ike Barinholtz says, hey, Will Smith, you can write a letter and get rid of the <laughs> Nick the Orc. He's, you know what they say, Will Smith, once with the Dark Lord, always with the Dark Lord. And I'm like, who says that? Who says once you're with the, what's a dark lord? 
I'll drop an orc. I don't give a shit. My family killed him by the thousands in Russia. And you're like, what are you talking about? What is any of this? And Will Smith says, yo, the whole world is watching this. Nick the orc is the first orc of the police force. I can't say no to this. The whole world is watching us. The whole world is watching this one orc on the LAPD? What? Mm. really Mm -hmm. will smith then says to his racist cop buddies he says here's what i don't understand how can a bunch of meatheads like you still have a beef with a whole race of people over something that happened two thousand years ago and i was like "Mm, i don't know will smith do you have any jewish friends (laughs) they might be able to explain this to you in simple terms that don't involve magic this is where i am on will smith's side in the movie where i'm like all of religion is largely stupid and people beefing over it today is also largely stupid In this movie, when you watched it, Uh did you think that Judaism and Christianity and Islam and Hinduism and Buddhism, like, did they all exist in this world? Because if you could have Uber and the Joe Rogan experience, I'm assuming that major religions also exist. Again, this is part part of the problem with the world building of this movie is it's real pick and choose. And it it asks more questions like this of like, hey, this thing happened to the... 2000 years ago and you're like you mean like jesus i mean because that's kind of what i go back to when i think of 2000 years ago just because judeo-christian beliefs and whatnot but it's like well if that didn't happen right if (laughs) if that didn't happen then there's no christianity and if there's no christianity like if there's no moses then that that would assume that there's no islam and so i don't know man it's a great question of what uh, religions exist, what religions don't, what do people believe in, what do they not believe in? As I said before, I think this is where long form books and and TV series can get into that stuff, and it can be really interesting and and satisfying narratively. And here, it's just a big question that hangs over the movie. Where like, I don't understand people's religion or lack thereof is one of the fundamental things about people. We cut to this pre shift meeting for the police officers, and it's run by police sergeant slash stand up comic Margaret. Cho, how about that? <laughs> right. She's calling out car assignments. And guess what, Bo? Will Smith and Nick the Orc, they're in the same car. Of course. Will Smith says he wants to be in a different car. And Margaret Cho says, nobody wants to ride with you, Will Smith, because you're an asshole. We intentionally teamed the least likable human cop. Mm -hmm. with the orc that no one wants to ride with speaking of which we now see nick the orc making his way to his patrol car kind of swimming upstream in a hallway full of officers going the opposite way and they're all giggling and laughing at him and bo nick the orc he turns around and someone has taped a piece of paper to his back that says kick me is the kick me sign the bottom of the barrel of comedy is that as low as it gets Uh, puns are are pretty low i think Um, kick me is even more cliche Although it worked pretty good in Back to the Future 1, with Crispin Glovin being all spastic because they're really giving him a good foot to the ass. And it's 1955. That's where the other that thing, point... is no one actually kicks Nick the Orc in this movie. If that were happening, if he were just getting kicked in the ass over and over again, <laughs> now you got something. But just for people to be like, he, he said his kick me. <laughs> That's not funny. It's funny if you kick him because of the sign, but just wearing the sign isn't of in and of itself funny. We cut to the police car. Will Smith is there with Nick the Orc, and Will Smith says, I need to know you're a cop first and an Orc second, and that you got my back when shit pops off. And then they drive past a bunch of cops that are just giving the beat down on this Orc with batons while this Orc's wife and Orc kid are just looking on in horror and disgust. This is where this centaur is. This scene, because it looks like there is a cop on a horse, but the cop is, in fact, a horse person. Wait, so having an orc as a patrol officer, the whole world's watching, but we can just have centaur horses? That's right. All right. (laughs) I I know! Apparently, centaurs were just like, hey, we're basically just people with horse from waist down, so we're kind of park police. You get two for one. Half the cost, right? Also... How much centaur human mating is going on in this world? I don't mean to be crude, Chad. I just want to know how much horse dick is being thrown around. Can you imagine what all of the internet porno sites were like in this yeah. world? Are you kidding me? Like Pornhub would have a whole section of centaur on human sex. <laughs> so donkey shows wouldn't even exist. It would just be centaur shows and it would be much more socially acceptable. Or donkey shows would just be really stupid centaurs. Like, who couldn't get work doing other stuff? Mommy, Daddy, I love him, but he's a horse. He's half man! You know, 
I know for a fact that this would happen because we live in a world already where people claim to marry ghosts and stuff <laughs> and bridges and houses and that kind of thing. So <laughs> a million percent there would be cross pollination between centaurs and people. And what does that look like? What what kind of weirdo <laughs> offshoot species do you get from that? Or maybe it's just a thing where like human women could not get pregnant from centaurs because they're two different species. <laughs> You know what? If there's mermaids out there, you get a centaur and a mermaid. God knows what's going to come from that. Oh, man. You get half fish, half horse. <laughs> if you're lucky. Or you just get a person. You get like, hey, top half comes from the centaur, bottom half. Or top half comes from the mermaid, bottom half comes from the centaur. You get. <laughs> Again, this is the part of the problem with this movie is like, I have a million questions about the practicality <laughs> of these creatures living among us. And this movie doesn't bother to answer any of those. Like, centaur porn sites, yes or no? That's all I need to know. Nick the Orc thinks about his question of who he's loyal to, the police force or the Orc clan. Again, don't mention that. Nick the Orc says, I'm a cop first. My badge means more to me than the air that I breathe. And in the background, you can see this Orc on the ground just getting the shit beat out of him yeah. by these cops. And then Will Smith and Nick the Orc, they roll over to this other situation where there's this homeless guy not wearing a shirt and just pants and he's screaming and yelling. He's in this intersection. He's wielding this giant sword and the guy's white so here all the cops are just letting this dude tire himself out rather than shoot him or beat the shit out of him because you see he's a white guy but mm -hmm. whereas the other guy was an orc see what's going on i thought he was and i may have this wrong but i thought he was kind of a giant no he looks like josh brolin like after taking a couple of months off from acting so they all show up and nick the orc he pops out he pulls his weapon but will smith does not because he's chit-chatting it up with a guy named rodriguez who works for the sheriff's department and they have a little chummy back and forth nick the orc gives some commands for this crazy homeless dude to put down his sword and he doesn't comply and then as he's screaming and yelling this crazy homeless dude is like the army of the nine races fought shoulder to shoulder to give you the world you neglect now the dark one returns to claim orc hearts and then nick <laughs> the orc says why is it everywhere i go orcs are always the bad guys and then the sheriff's deputy says okay don't ask me mexicans are still getting shit over the alamo and that's where i was like wait what the alamo was a mm -hmm. thing the mexican-american war still happened you think Pee Wee herman went there and just found a bunch of orcs and fairies flying around no basement and Pee Wee Herman, <laughs> there's no basement to the Alamo. <laughs> Say hello to my friend, Pedro and Inez. <laughs> ah, <laughs> we are making maze. <laughs> So the homeless guy ignores Nick the Orc's commands to drop his weapon. Will Smith takes over and he says, unless you want to die, drop that fucking sword now. Clank, the guy just drops the sword. Mm -hmm. And then Will Smith says to Nick the Orc, hey, you got me shot once. Don't get me stabbed. And I'm like, dude, let it go. You just said you wanted the reset button. <laughs> it's not been three minutes and you're bringing it up again. Who's the one not letting it go, Will Smith? I think the answer is you. You know, remember <laughs> when you point a finger at someone else, you have three fingers pointing back at you and mm -hmm. one up at god that's right that's <laughs> assuming god exists in this world <laughs> by the way they're like they're throwing the dude in the back seat and, and will smith grabs the sword and is throwing it in the back as well did you think the sword was gonna matter absolutely and of course and it, it doesn't. doesn't yeah i mean it's not just like a, it's not a sword you can buy at that weird store that somehow hasn't gone out of business in the mall this sword is what a good four feet long five feet long with the handle it's huge it's like a, a big broadsword kind of affair and Rodriguez is like, hey, I just want to let you know a bunch of these gangs are, are really cutting up today, so be careful out there. It's like, okay, you get the sense that these two guys, Will Smith and Rodriguez, know each other and they're friendly and all that stuff. Will Smith kind of gives them some shit about having another baby and yada yada. Like, they're familiar and friendly with one another, which will come into yeah. play later. So they get back in the car. They're heading to the station. The giant just pukes in the back seat. I like that you call him a giant. The dude looked like he was five foot two or three to me. He, he didn't look like a giant at all. Maybe it's just the beard. I assume anyone <laughs> with a beard like that is probably a giant of some kind. He did have a Hagrid-esque beard. Yes. But I do not think he was a giant. Okay. I really saw him as being Josh Brolin. Fair enough. But he does barf up orange baby food. And starts spewing all this prophecy stuff in Orcish. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Will Smith is like, hey, what, you speak Orcish? Mm -hmm. And he's telling Nick the, the Orc, the Dark One is coming. The prophecy is about to 
come to pass. The man mm-hmm. with you has been blessed. And that's the point where you said you were on board with like, oh, okay, so Will Smith is a bright. He does tell Nick the Orc, the prophecy has chosen you, Nick the Orc. And he's like, huh? Me? Huh? Remember your traditions, brother. Only the clan can save you. Let me ask you a question. How are you? Are you good at keeping oaths? Do you consider yourself an oath keeper? <laughs> just, I'm just asking. Just asking. Just tell me this. <laughs> Where were you on January 6th? Were you with the people or not? And I assume January 6th happened in this world, too. Sure. You know, as soon as Trump got elected, it was just, <laughs> we've got to do something about these orcs. They're all over the place. <laughs> we got to send him back to Orkland or wherever they come from. I don't think so. I think he was wearing a bunch of Make America Orc Again hats. Oh, you and like, those really? are his people. Yeah. Not what I would expect, but all right. <laughs> it would be the best of all possible worlds, I think. We cut to the police station and Will Smith is hosing out this orange vomit. Then two guys from Internal Affairs show up, one of which looks a lot like Borat, and the other one looked like a 75-year-old Bobby Lee. Doesn't really matter because these guys aren't in the movie very long. They show up and Internal Affairs tells Will Smith that Nick the Orc's statement about the incident when Will Smith was was supposedly shot that what happened was nick the orc chased down the bad guy and they ended up down this alley but that the orc thug disarmed nick the orc and then leapt 13 feet into the air and got away on a fire escape one of the internal affair cops says uh this leap is impossible for an orc they can't jump that high they're strong that's why half the nfl's defense line is orcish hey it's not racism it's just physics i'm like no this is racism Mm -hmm. and i get what you're doing please stop i wish you could write a letter to this movie that just says i get it you can stop this now just tell your story i get it and so orcs play football in the nfl but having one as a police officer is a worldwide event Mm -hmm. that's right right. so internal affairs says hey will smith take this recorder and we want you to get nick the orc to admit that he let that orc go because he holds clan above all else and uh, once we get that on tape we can fire him thanks a lot will smith Uh, even though it doesn't really matter at at any point in this movie uh, we know that you're in a lot of debt yeah, so, you owe a lot of money. To the mob, or did he just overextend himself? Uh, it doesn't matter. Why bother to explain it? Bring it up in the first place? We probably shouldn't, but we did. All right, see you later. Anyway, he agrees to do it. He's like, hey, I, this is going to be totally off the record. No depositions, no written statements, nothing like that, but I'll get your confession. Yeah, because he's a piece of shit. Yeah. And then they go to the patrol car. And it's Will Smith and Nick the Orc. And Will Smith is real smooth about he, how he coaxes this confession out of Nick the Orc. <laughs> yeah. And he, he says, yo, so my daughter, she be doing shit all the time. And she don't have no business doing. And then she comes clean and tells the truth. And it feels good to her and me. Truth has a way to clear the air between people. It cleanses some shit. So tell the truth. You have anything you want to tell the truth about? It is so ham-handed. My daughter be doing shit all the time. She shouldn't be doing <laughs> and Nick the Ork is just like, look, I knew something bad happened at the station. And he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. That's crazy. This is just unprompted questioning about the, the thing that we agreed not to talk about anymore. We are a quarter of the way through this movie and nothing has happened. Other than Will Smith got shot, we found out that orcs, fairies, and elves live in the real world. That, unfortunately, the Joe Rogan Experience podcast is around. And that Uber and the history of the Texas War of Independence is a thing. <laughs> okay, so we, we've we got one other moving part to this movie, which, which happens here. Uh-huh. Where the feds show up. Yeah, from the Federal Magic Task Force. Right. And so it's <laughs> John Goodman Jr. Uh-huh. is one of them. He's the human. D- dude, did it not look like they de-aged John Goodman in this movie? movie yeah i thought it was him for a moment just somehow less wrinkly and and it's a bit fuller a beard than i've yeah. seen john goodman with but it's him and uh-huh. then there's this elf dude with kind of grayish hair who looks a ton like joaquin phoenix right <laughs> we see them in passing as nick the orc and will smith are getting in their car and then we cut back to him after the conversation about like the daughter always be doing shit and <laughs> the feds are questioning this dude that had the sword out in the middle of the street and this is where we learn that they're with the magic task force and they're questioning this guy about the inferni which are renegade elves who want to bring back the dark lord that we've heard so much about so here is a premise that does not matter in this movie which is that when the inferni have these three magic wands they can raise the dark lord again john goodman jr holds up two pictures and he's like hey there do you recognize either 
there are these two people. And this homeless guy's like, that picture, oh yeah, one on the left, that's Leela. She's a coven leader. She's a bright. That's the name of this movie, by the way, bright. You ever notice how brights are always elves and they run the world? You know, I mean, I'm just, right. I'm just asking Illuminate, questions. Illuminati. Mm-hmm. Which uh, later you learn that the Illuminati was a real thing that doesn't exist anymore, but did at one time. And also, if you didn't think Will Smith was a bright, here's the point where you know for sure that's going to happen. Uh, here's a fun fact. Did you know that there are some humans that are bright, but there's like one in a million, you know? Hey, would you boys touch one of them wands? Like, I mean, you, real, real talk here with just us, just the boys. If you touch it and you're not a bright, you will explode, which right. sucks. But I would totally touch one just to know, just to know who you were. One in a million chance that you're a bright. So, hypothetically, I put a million guns on this table, single, <laughs> single shot, and you can pick up any one and put it to your head and pull the trigger. If it don't go off, you're bright and you get a magic wand and you can get all kinds of wishes and shit. You do that. You do that. You take your mods. Hey, better than Powerball. That's better than Powerball. All right? I play Powerball. I ain't never won, but I play it. I'd pick up a gun. I'd put it to my head. I want to find out if I'm a bright. i get them one of them ones. You know what I'd wish for? Jersey Mike sub. Now, I could pay for one, but when it's free, it's better. This is a bit of a cheat. I would wish for a million more wishes. I get it that I have unlimited wishes, but it's just the point. I tell you, you know it's a good movie? A DuckTales movie. That was a movie about wishes. I used to watch that when I was a kid all the time. And so they're like, hey, enough of this shit. We're trying to track down Layla and this, this one. And he's like, hey, what are you going to do when you find it? You're going to roll out a bunch of tanks? What's I going to do against Magic Wand? Nothing. I just told you about the Jersey Mike and the DuckTales. You can't do nothing against a wand like that. Hey, I'll tell you what's going to happen. 2,000 years ago, the Shield of Light showed up and stopped the Dark Lord with magic. And guess what? Yeah. This time when it comes, Shield of Light's going to be right back, brother. Yeah, you were looking at ground zero of ass whooping the Dark Lord. And by the way, I'm done talking now. Unless you guys show up with the Jersey Mike sub that we talk about. I'm finished. You tell me Bright 2 is all about this crazy, shirtless, filthy homeless guy and his adventures with swords and <laughs> Jersey Mike subs. I'd watch that in Bright 2. Brought to you by Jersey Mike's, sure. <laughs> but our Joaquin Phoenix elf is like, I have to tell you, if you act like my enemy, you will become my enemy. He's like, whatever, brother. You just remember, I want the large size sub and it better be warmed up. If I get a cold Italian sub in here, the deal is off. We cut to Will Smith and Nick the Orc driving now in an SUV to a new location and it's night. By the way, this whole movie takes place in one day. And one of them sees a kid who's sitting up on some steps and he's a spotter. And we know this because Nick the Orc says, oh, that kid's a spotter. Did you see that, Will Smith? I think I saw a spotter. <laughs> Let me back up. That one. He's a spotter. He ran away. <laughs> but as soon as they get out of the car, immediately somebody is shooting at them. It's like an Old West shootout. Yeah. After some comical banter while they're hiding behind their SUV that's not very funny, eventually Will Smith shoots and kills the one lone gunman. We know he kills him because his arm flops out the window and he drops his gun. <laughs> you hear a Wilhelm scream. Will Smith and Nick the Orc. They enter the building to find the guy they just shot and killed. But, Bo, there are some other bodies that have been burned up alive and are still glowing red from the inside out. Also, Orcs, as we noticed earlier, when Nick the Orc smelled the human shit on Will Smith's front lawn, mm -hmm. he shows off his sense of smell here, and he's like, hey, I smell lots of blood in this place. I think there's some dead people inside. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you think? Because of all the corpses we're passing? And they find another burn corpse, and I actually like the burn corpse effects. I, th I think they look pretty gnarly. And they also find, like, a shitload of guns and claymore mines and all kinds of stuff. Uh -huh. Then they find the body of the shooter and yet another of these burning corpses, like, on their path through the halls of this place. Right. And then Nick is like... <laughs> Hey, where's Smith? I smell somebody else with us. They smell good, like maybe lavender. I think they were washing their hair recently. They come around the corner, and there's this woman. At first, I thought it was a painting on the wall. Mm -hmm. But later, we're going to find out it's an actual woman that's stuck to the wall or in the wall. And on the left and the right of her body are these glowing, it looks like angel wings in a way that are sort of pulsing with light. Maybe the coolest like visual of the movie. Like, oh, this seems kind of inventive and unusual. Like, I've never seen anything quite like this in a movie before yeah but yeah it's just an elf that is kind of fused into the wall by these like tubes or whatever then off to the side someone darts away and will smith screams freeze motherfucker and then this mystery person just dashes away parkour 
and they leak over some tables and like, parkour and they do a somersault and they're parkour and they swing on the top of a gate unnecessarily and then back with parkour over a car parkour and then they end up catching her and in doing so a magic wand falls out of this mystery woman's overalls and manages to fire off a bolt or something which explodes a car <laughs> yeah will smith asks her who are you and nick the orc says hey look i took two years of elvish in high school let me see if i can communicate with her Bleep, blah, 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 blah. i asked her what the bathroom was what is elvish for don't install a biblioteca <laughs> esther how to say ed asner is a hoot she does not know <laughs> um <laughs> and Asner is a hoot. We cut to a few minutes later in our movie, and Will Smith is telling Ike Barinholtz and his mustache, along with the openly bisexual stand up comic term police sergeant Margaret Cho, plus two other racist cops, mm -hmm. about the magic wand that they found. And Ike Barinholtz says, That's magic. You want a million dollars? You could get a million dollars. You want $10 million? You get $10 million. You want to be taller or shorter? You want to have a bigger dick? You want to go back in time and marry the girl who didn't blow you on prom night? That's how you do it right there. That's magic wait a minute i'm not sure first off that there are that many people who are going to wish to be short maybe shaquille o'neal right mm -hmm. hey magic wand i'm tired of bumping my head every time i go into another room maybe a little bit shorter so i'm put icy hot on on my scalp to ease the pain i won't live a normal life i'm, I'm shaquille o'neal and then also you don't want to go back in time and marry the girl who wouldn't blow you on prom night you go back in time and marry the girl who did blow you on prom night because mm -hmm. she sounds like a pretty good time or the guy who blew you i don't know what you're into whatever marry both of them you know like sure. you, do anything. you get a magic wand marry an orc <laughs> or an elf <laughs> right or a fairy really do something taboo minotaur or a giant maybe that guy was a giant maybe he was the littlest giant the littlest <laughs> giant like the <laughs> alan havey story where they tie him to the antenna i was thinking when stimpy was the littlest giant that's what i always think of we're old do you remember the alan havey story do you remember this on night after night mm, i don't think i do alan havey did the fake talk show night after night and he told a, a children's story called the littlest indian and it was about how there was this teeny tiny Indian that lived in a tribe with all of his friends. And one day they decided to go into town. And so to give the littlest Indian uh, an adventure, they took a string and they tied him to the antenna. So he'd kind of fly around as they were driving into town. And then they get to town and they look at the string and realize that at some point during the drive, the littlest Indian has come loose and is lost somewhere on the road. And the end of the story was... And so all the Indians decided that they would turn around and go look for him, but they never got around to it. And that was the end of the story. That sounds like a Jack Handy story. Very similar. The, the Alan Havy and Jack Handy stuff is uh, of a stripe. But all these guys, this is like when you sit around talking to your friends about what you, you would do if you won the lottery. Because as soon as this magic wand comes into play, they're like, oh, we're going to have to kill somebody to keep this. Ike Barinholtz immediately tells Will Smith, look, here's what's going to happen. We're going to go out there. We're going to kill that elf. We're going to kill the orc. And then we're going to take the magic wand and we're going to give ourselves great big dicks and millions of dollars. All right. So look, we can either kill you, Will Smith, along with the two of them or you can stick around and be part of the big dick money train what's it gonna be will smith so then will smith finds himself caught between some dirty cops and a hard place so he walks outside to go kill nick the orc he seems to make the choice to kill nick the orc and he leaves the dirty cops behind and on the way out he calls his wife and says go find our daughter remember we have a daughter well we do and she's at our grandmother her grandmother's is it your mom or my mom? Doesn't matter. It's one of them. And then you need to get out of town. I love you. Bye. And he hangs up. Imagine getting a call from your significant other. You need to just get out of town. What? Do you do that? And also, where do you go? How are you going to get in touch later? If you live a life where your significant other calls you up and says, get out of town, click. First off, you know where you're going. You know that you have a go bag ready. Mm -hmm. There is a car parked at the airport waiting for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Will Smith is up to some real shady shit <laughs> if, if you had any questions whether or not you married a dirty cop they're answered there yeah i think she might have been the one who turned him dirty will smith he eventually makes it outside and nick the orc looks up and says hey will smith i learned this elf's name is tika remember that little junior gangbanger we saw he saw that we have a wand so that might be some trouble you look like you have something on your mind will smith huh like you're thinking about killing somebody but you don't want to do it but the alternative would be you getting killed maybe hmm 
Am I reading too much into your face? Maybe you just want some more pancakes or something? Hey, do you want to go get that burrito that you never got? I'll go get you that right now. Will Smith says, back when I got shot, you let that orc get away because he's clam blood, didn't you? You pig skin piece of shit. You ruined my life. And Will Smith pulls his gun on Nick the Orc and Nick the Orc's like, whoa, 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 Will Smith. Hey, look, look. Okay, yeah, I let the orc go, but it's not what you think, okay? It's not about the clan. <laughs> Stop talking about the clan. By the way, inside, while they're having this dispute in the parking lot, all yeah. the corrupt cops in there are like, all right, we're going to kill Will Smith too, right, everybody? And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, we're totally going to kill Will Smith too. Ike Barinholtz says that. He was like, completely that's what we're gonna do and then two of the cops leave and margaret chose like so what's the real real plan he's like oh we're gonna kill those those two dirty cops then we're gonna kill the orc and the elf and will smith she's like okay great and he's like and when you leave i'm gonna kill you and the dirty cops and will smith well, you're and gonna the kill orc me and the elf. yeah and then i think i'm gonna kill myself <laughs> and then and then no one gets you know what i haven't really thought through how many people i'm gonna kill but i've never been good at math but if it's common knowledge that you have to be a bright to use these wands and only one in a million humans are bright is the ultimate plan here. We're going to take turns and just grab this thing mm -hmm. and see what happens. And you just keep blowing up. <laughs> right <laughs> it's so foolish it's a terrible plan because at some point you got to bring somebody in that you know can use it in this scene ike barinholtz reaches down at one point and picks up the wand and i was like whoa wait what's going on here my wife was like oh he's wearing a glove yeah, yeah he's got a big rubber glove on but i didn't realize that i was like i thought you had to be a bright or you blew up or something but physical contact with the thing or something i don't know oh again gosh. questions that it would be great to answer <sighs> So back outside, Nick the Orc is, you know, standing at the business end of a police laser blaster bullet gun from the future. And Nick the Orc says, hey, look, my teeth are filed down. Look, I'm not blooded. All right, my dad wasn't blooded. His father wasn't blooded. I've been shit on my whole life by Orc people. And all I ever wanted to do was be a police officer. Why? Mm, I don't know. I didn't let that Orc go because of clan politics. I just had the wrong guy. Look, watch this sepia-toned, choppily edited flashback version of what really happened, and I'll narrate it for you. Okay, look, this is me, and I'm chasing the guy, and then I lost him, and then we go down the alley, and then I realize, wait a minute, this kid is spray painting. That's not the guy I was chasing. He didn't have a spray paint can, and I realized he, the words he was writing was, Dale sucks a mean weenie, and I thought, I can't arrest this kid, so I helped him get up on the fire escape, and he got away. That's what really happened. Why did you let him go there? He's like, look, all those cops. They were going to kill an orc. They were all hopped up on racism and whatnot. So I just let him go <laughs> because I didn't want an innocent orc to be killed. That's all. At about this time, Ike Barinholtz and his corrupt cop crew come walking outside. And Ike Barinholtz says, hey, Will Smith, it's time. And Nick the Orc says, time? Time for what? Oh, you're going to kill me, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. And Will Smith has his back to him. And he says, how many are there and what order are they standing in? Or there's four of them. It's Ike Barinholtz, then his mustache, then that bald racist cop, then star of the ABC sitcom All-American Girl, Margaret Cho, and then some other guy who I don't know who he is. And so Will Smith <laughs> spins and then in slow motion murders these four cops. It's a real Zack Snyder moment. It really is. And then at that point, Nick the Orc pulls his gun on Will Smith. Holy shit, you just shot for cops. Dude, put down your gun. I'm going to shoot you. I'm a police officer. You just shot for people in front of me. Nick the Orc puts the wand in the car while Will Smith is trying to explain why he did this. I didn't have a choice. They were going to kill you. All right. And then introduce yet another moving piece of this movie that we really don't need. Poison and his gang of Hispanic hooligans. Poison, who is the head of these gangbangers, and he's in a wheelchair, which I like that touch of diversity and inclusion, Bo. That was nice. <laughs> well, and it gives him the stakes for why he wants the wand, as we'll learn in a minute. He's like, hey, S.A., word on the street is you got a wand in this neighborhood. Yeah, wand in this hood makes that my wand. One, two, three, tic-tac-toe. I like the fact that your only impression for Hispanic people is from Stand and Deliver. Edward James Olmos as an inspiring calculus teacher. It's the equivalent <laughs> of Eric Carbon. So yeah, I, I want to teach these kids. Will Smith knows him. He's like, hey, Poison, what you heard was wrong. We're about to get in the car and take off. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, I don't think so, Will Smith. We, yeah, if there's a wand in this neighborhood, it belongs to the neighborhood. And that means it belongs to us. And mm -hmm. so they manage to get in the car because Will Smith's like, get the fuck in the car, Nick the Orc. And they manage to get in the car. And when you say they, you mean Will Smith, 
Nick the Orc and Tika, That's who right. does nothing in this movie except run her fingers on the walls of dirty bathrooms and kind of play with teddy bears that are being sold by street vendors. She does nothing. I thought she was going to be a real, what is it, six element? What was fifth the fifth element. element? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she, yeah. she is dressed very similar to Lilo from the fifth element. I thought the same thing. That was my first impression that she would be the key. She would get the wand and do crazy stuff, but she doesn't do anything. She's a real MacGuffin in this movie. (laughs) The only thing that she really makes me do is think how much I want some chicken tikka masala all through the movie. (laughs) <laughs> like, oh yeah so tiki masala would be good they get in the the police car which has bulletproof windows thank god we get a car chase bo your favorite yeah it is my favorite there are two good car chases in the history of cinema as, as far as i'm concerned this is not one of them the finale of the original gone in 60 seconds no yes all right well you if you say so we reviewed the remake of that I that a re- that finale is one of the most banana bonkers they were crashing cars like on city streets without any regard for human safety there are two and they're both by william friedkin the blues brothers in that mall that was pretty good i don't like that <laughs> shame on you i like the car chasing the l train in french connection and i think uh-huh. the car chase in to live and die in la on all the streets and overpasses and stuff is actually really really good that opening of baby driver that's pretty good that is pretty good okay okay baby driver <laughs> make it that's, the, baby driver is really good there's a car chase the gang is shooting at the police car one of the doors falls off it doesn't matter there's a car chase and then the, they get rid of all the gang bangers and then suddenly the wand starts glowing inside the police suv yeah floats up between them tika's in the back seat and she starts spouting off a bunch of elfish nonsense as the wand is floating in the air and then the police suv crashes into an invisible wall causing like a one car invisible wall car accident and so we cut away from that to our magic task force guys seeing some chatter on the internet or whatever about a magic wand and they're like oh i think it's how we jump in action yeah we, we need to get back in this movie and so we'll see them in about five six scenes and then we see will smith and his crew nick the orc and tika walking away from the wreckage to let us know uh-huh. that they're alive i guess they explained that the reason the wand went bonkers is that it is attached to its owner and can only go so far right and that's why it put up the force field to prevent it from getting away from whoever owns it Speaking of which, Bo, Uh I think we're about halfway through our movie, so we should introduce our movie's villains. Leela and the Inferni, which is a great college band. Yes. Leela, played by Numi Rapace, who, Uh as I mentioned in the introduction, if you ever saw any of them, uh, original Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, it's her. She played Lisbeth Salander in all of those and has been in a million things at this point. She's a ubiquitous actress. Her and the rest of her Inferni coven, which is a ball dude. It looks like Agent 47. Black suit, white shirt, possibly red tie, maybe tattoo on the back of his head. Yeah, boy's a time bomb. (laughs) <laughs> black suit white shirt bald head there's another heavy with them it's a woman she doesn't really matter she's just like their third yeah and when leela goes into the main building and she walks over to what as i mentioned earlier i thought was a painting of a woman with angel wings here it's revealed that it's an actual woman and layla our main baddie she heads back into the building and finds the woman smacked up against the wall with the glowing angel wings and layla walks over and whispers larika who wakes up and Larika's like, oh shit, the traitor escaped. Bad news. She has your wand. I fucked up. And then Layla just slits Larika's throat. Mm-hmm. And then Layla walks over and rips out Ike Barinholt's throat and steals his police badge as maybe a souvenir. She puts it to use in the next scene where. Where? Oh, this is also, by the way, when, when after she kills Ike Barinholtz and steals his badge, where we get the wide shot and see a dragon flying around in the L.A. skyline. And it's like, oh, OK, I, I guess dragons are real, too. Fair enough. I've really tamped down how much I, I hated all this elf dragon bullshit for this conversation like i didn't want to dominate it when i saw this scene with the dragon flying against the moon i was just like this is idiotic because they just did it as a you know it'd be cool put a dragon in there dragons are not even mentioned at all in this movie right how have they affected global politics like why not have ufos and (laughs) and like other crazy shit bigfoots and loch nesses and yetis why isn't joaquin phoenix's elf character why isn't his partner a zombie sure get some of them tremors worms in there like make time travel a thing this is your partner uh, he's a graboid yeah. give us a jabber jaw 
It's how a king shark happens. Essentially, this just becomes a real life Roger Rabbit that's full of every bit of crazy nonsense that, you know, humans have been able to conjure up. If anything is possible, then nothing matters, you know? Yeah. Did you see the movie Upward? No. That's really what they do in that movie. It's just full of all kinds of crazy mythological nonsense. But it deals with two brothers and their dead dad. Again, if you're trying to set this in a real world, part of the fun of urban fantasy stuff is getting the repercussions on the real world of this fantasy stuff. Like, I can kind of get behind, oh, there's this social stratification between elves and orcs because you're playing on something that feels like it might naturally happen in this world that you've created. But like you said, when you just throw in a dragon, it's like, well, are dragons smart? Are they dumb? Do they just roam around breathing fire? Can they breathe fire at all? Like, it's all these questions about how this impacts the world and you never get any answers to that i thought the harry potter series did a really good job because that series taking place so much in on the magical side of things Mm -hmm. but seeing how the human world or muggles as Mm. my wife informed me they're called Mm -hmm. how those elements infused into their world you know that they sort of made their way organically whether it was through newspapers or games of sport or sort of the interest but the two never completely coexisted at the same time well and there are plot points where oh you accidentally screwed up and revealed magic as being real in a human context so we've got to go like wipe the the minds of these people so that they don't lose their shit over the fact that suddenly magic is real and you know all bets are off like that's part of the mythology of that story is that you have to keep those things separate and when they cross over that's when things get dicey and you just don't have any of that differentiation here it's all thrown into a blender but like i said you just don't get any of the the knock-on effects of centaurs are on the police force what does that mean why are centaurs allowed on the police force and not orcs why is that a thing does leela use that badge to get into the neighbor's house yeah she flashes the badge and Um. she asks what they saw and we realize like it's this whole family of people in there and the guy's like well we saw an elf and then these (laughs) inferny elves just murder everyone in the building including the baby in the crib Mm, that sounds like a great idea murder everyone murder for all murder for all you can almost hear max landis being like he's so hardcore we're gonna kill baby and use the baby. F word a bunch. How did you feel when just topless women started showing up later? Dude, that we'll get to it in a minute. I don't know what this place is. This casino club, drug den strip club that they go to. I don't know. We'll talk about it in a minute. But so Will Smith, they're like trying to basically find ground to to go to. They're like, well, we, we got to get out of this neighborhood and get free of the cops who are trying to kill us, along with the gang who's trying to kill us, both of whom are looking for this wand. And we'll just stash this wand here and get out. Oh, that's a bad idea, Will Smith. That wand is like a nuclear weapon that grants wishes. Yeah. We should call the feds. Will Smith is like, no, 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 we, we can't trust them. So what we'll do is we'll call my buddy Rodriguez from earlier in the movie. Mm-hmm. We'll get him to come in because I at least trust him. I know he's not dirty. Then a bunch of gangbangers show up to give chase. And our trio of heroes, they dash away, just randomly shooting gangbangers one after the other. And then Nick the Orc drops the wand. And a gangbanger picks it up. And he explodes and kills all of his nearby gangbanger friends. Yeah. So that gangbanger wasn't up right because he blew up. Nick the Orc is like, hey, where did he go? And Will Smith is <laughs> like, I think you're breathing him right now. Which, not a terrible line if the rest of the movie being what it is. But I enjoyed that yeah. part of it. So our trio then runs off after they put the wand in a bag using a cloth to pick it up. Mm -hmm. And they end up in a nightclub and there are people doing drugs, some of which are humans, some of which are orcs. I guess the people would be the people, humans, and the orcs would be the orcs. Mm -hmm. There are some women there, some of which are topless. They're human women that are topless. I don't think I saw any topless orcs in there, which I don't know that I saw any female orcs. Oh, wait, no, there was the one woman screaming because her husband was getting beat by the cops. So I did see at least one. And in this nightclub, there's all this chaos and music playing. Our trio gets separated. Then the gangbangers show up and they just start spraying bullets everywhere. And this whole scene ends with Will Smith and Nick the Orc using their pepper spray to get out of a mosh pit. And then Tika just parkours her way to safety. And we cut away from that to the Magic Task Force who finally show up at this crime scene where there are four dead cops. The Joaquin Phoenix elf investigates Larika, the woman kind of built into the wall who is now had her throat slit. And he gives her a sniff. And he's like, yeah, she's in Fernie. Also, Layla was here. Also, she doesn't have her wand. Also, that means she's vulnerable. They 
put together that Nick the Orc and Will Smith have Tika with them somehow. And the Joaquin Phoenix elf says he needs Tika as bait to get Layla, who he's been on the hunt for for 20 years. None of that makes sense, but okay. Back to Nick the Orc et al. who are on the street. And Nick the Orc is like, hey, we should have done all that at the Fog Teeth Bar. And Will Smith's like, hey... Shut the fuck up. And he's like, I'm just saying, orcs hold a grudge, you know? Like, one time I stepped on my uncle's foot as a kid, just an accident, and he not only left me out of his wheel, every time he saw me, he just punched me right in the teeth. Shut the fuck up. Go over there and buy some hoodies. No one's going to think we're suspicious wearing black hoodies walking around. They end up swapping some clothes out, and then they go into yet another casino club, drugged in strip club. Yeah. And this time, Poison's guys follow them in and start shooting yep. up the place. I don't these are all poisons guy maybe well poisons with them this time because yeah. he rolls in in his wheelchair and he's like hey will smith everybody wants to cut your head off give me that one so i can walk again and make love to my old lady and get rid of this colostomy bag yeah and he's like look i'll let you walk out of here otherwise if you don't give me the wand i'm gonna nail the door shut bro and then i'm gonna burn the place down and i will pick the wand out of the ashes and i will laugh why not just give him the wand? Because the odds are so much in your favor that he's not a bright and he would just explode. Well, that's what Will Smith proposes. He's like, well, let's just give him the wand and he'll, worst case scenario, we, we're, we're dead, which we already are. Best case scenario, it blows him and his friends up. Clearly, I wasn't paying attention yeah. while watching this. But Nick the Orc is like, no, we can't do that, Will Smith. That would be giving him too much power. And he's like, all right, you want to die in a titty bar gunfight? Let's die in a titty bar gunfight. That's what we're about to that, do. Though. That's actual dialogue. That is absolutely actual dialogue. Then Tika decides to show up in our movie and she starts spazzing out, babbling about how the devil is coming. And sure enough, Layla, Agent 47, the elf, and that third female elf, they show up and they just slaughter these gangbangers, including Poison. And then Will Smith and Nick the Orc take Tika and they just run away. That's what yeah. they do a lot in this movie. They just run away. And then a SWAT team shows up, but Layla kills all of the SWAT team with violent acrobatics. Mm -hmm. And then our trio of heroes, they go into this convenience store to get something for will smith to put on his wounds because he got grazed with a bullet shockingly because they were flying everywhere and then nick the orc goes in the bathroom with will smith while he nurses his wounds and tika's there and nick the orc says so will smith uh i'm probably not a cop anymore after tonight right and will smith says nah man and we need to spend the night trying just to survive and Nick the Orc says, you know, being a cop, that's all I am. You know, I mean, I wanted to be a cop for like a few weeks, but that's the only thing I ever wanted to do my whole life. I, I won't be a cop more than I wanted to be there. Remember I said that earlier? Anyway, Orcs always choose the wrong side of things. They did a long time ago, like 2,000 years ago in the Dark Lord or something about that. They said that earlier too. Orcs see me as a wannabe human, and people see me as kind of an animal, so I'm kind of stuck in the middle. You know, uh, when you came out of the house this morning, remember that earlier in the movie? You had all that hatred in your eyes. And Will Smith says... <laughs> Yo, why didn't you tell me about helping that orc kid? I'm your partner. You can't lie to me. I have to trust you. And Nick the orc says, uh, oh, yeah, that sounds pretty good. But uh, how can I trust you if you don't trust me? You know, blah, 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 blah. Are we friends now? Yeah. And Will Smith is like, look, I got to say, you're a good cop. And Nick's like, really? You think so? Because all I ever want to be is like you. Because to get blooded, an orc has to do an act of great bravery. And to me, you are a blooded human because you are really brave. Like, you just walk around like you know what to do all the time. And I wish I knew what to do all the time. Will Smith is like, you know, you don't want me to be your friend. I just pretend to be a good dude. You actually are one. Ah, oh, that's so nice for you to say, Will Smith. That makes me want to be like you even more because you said that I'm a good guy. And then Rodriguez, our sheriff, shows up. Mm -hmm. And Will Smith goes out to beat him and Rodriguez pulls a gun on him. Is like, hey, man, you are in serious serious trouble because to the best of our knowledge here you have just murdered four cops will smith says oh whoa, whoa, whoa. we have a magic wand and rodriguez says hmm you have a good point we need to keep that from the bad guys and then tika walks out and rodriguez is shocked to see an elf he's like fuck is that an elf like dude there's elf town it's the where the rich people live and he's shocked to see one like this is a random occurrence mm -hmm. maybe it's random because he's seeing an elf outside of elf town maybe on the knows, rough man. part of town or something it, it, regardless rodriguez is like look i gotta make a phone call this is a little over my pay grade we gotta we yeah. gotta figure this out so he calls the magic task force bloop, bloop, bloop. 
Magic Task Force. I've got a real call, please. Uh, do you have one that looks like Joaquin Phoenix? Uh, hold on a moment. Burp, burp, burp. Thanks. Dun, 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 dun. Hey, this is Wacky Phoenix. And so Will Smith <laughs> is like, hey, give me the phone. And he takes the phone and Joaquin Phoenix says, do you have a wand? And Will Smith is like, are you interested in astronomy? <laughs> and he's like, yes. He's like, are you interested in sea tech astronomy? And he says, I'm interested, I'm interested in, all in all kinds of, of astronomy. <laughs> Dan Aykroyd's like, true. The Joaquin Phoenix elf is like, look, I can protect you from Layla and her crew, but you got to come in. You got to give me the wand. And also, Layla and her guys are listening in from some cell tower hack or something. And then that third random uh, henchman, she picks up a fireman's axe and smashes a cable and cuts down all the phone lines in the city. And so the feds have narrowed the trace to like a few blocks. Layla kind of knows where they are too get them and so right so now the chase is on rodriguez says hey guys i have to cuff you because if the feds show up and you're not cuffed they're gonna kill you both and you're like okay whatever so he cuffs will smith and nick the orc then immediately rodriguez gets shot by someone it's layla and her thugs yeah and then Tika just picks up the keys to the handcuffs and immediately removes them off Will Smith and I think Nick the Orc was like, so why put him on in the first place? It means nothing. And so they run into the convenience store. Will Smith is like, hey, store owner, you should get down. And he's like, what? Bam, bam, bam. Kapow! <laughs> right, he's dead. <laughs> and so one of the Inferni drives through the front of the store in an SUV, which slams into Nick. It's Agent 47, and he doesn't just smash into the convenience store, Bo. He drives around this store like it's the racetrack at Daytona. Mm -hmm. Like, he's going up and down the aisles. It's wild how they have this little car chase inside this convenience store. Magic. I guess so. It's all com completely unexciting. I like when Tika picked up that bottle of blue windshield wiper fluid and bonked that third henchman on the head with it. Yeah. <laughs> all right. But anyway, so they just run again. It's just the, uh -huh. they Will Smith and Tika and Nick the Orc run away while yeah. Layla and the Inferni are like on fire inside. Yeah, because well, Will Smith fires a bullet at a row of like WD-40 or roach spray or something and causes the entire convenience store to explode. So the feds see this fireball from a distance and they're like, hey, I bet our quarry is there. Right. They run away, but then a bunch of orcs surround Will Smith and Nick the Orc and Tika. They're wearing like gang clothes yeah. and their hats are backwards or sideways ways and they got chains and boom boxes on their shoulders and one of them is named radio orkeem they're drinking orc english malt liquor <laughs> right will smith really will smith it up in this moment where he's like nick the orc i want you to tell all of them that they are under arrest hey i think uh, they all speak english you guys all speak english right they do they you can just tell them that this is the one that stuck out to me where will smith refers to one as having a shrek looking ass and he tells him to get home to Fiona. Yeah. So Shrek exists in this world? As does it three sequels and the spinoff Puss in Boots and the Christmas themed special Shrek the Halls. They all exist in this world, yes. Wouldn't Shrek be the equivalent of Song of the South in this universe? Absolutely. Your culture's not my costume, Bo. Right. You know? I even wondered, did Robin Williams star in the 1980s hit sitcom Mork and Mindy because he was Mork from Ork? Like, would that have been oh, frowned upon? Oh, right, right. Do you think that the pest control company Orkin exists? Or do you think calling a pest removal company Orkin is just a bridge too far? Like, what are you saying? We're diseased? We're like bugs. We're like rats. Something to be exterminated. That's a good point, too. Hell no. Orc won't go. Hell no. Orc won't go. There are so many cans of worms opened up by this. And like, did <laughs> Lord of the Rings ever get written? If so, was it historical fiction? It's a real head scratcher. <laughs> These orcs then proceed to start beating the shit out of Will Smith and Nick the Orc, leaving Tika alone to do the same thing she's done uh, for this entire movie. Nothing. And then we <laughs> cut to a location where the head orc of this gang is doing his best Scarface, sitting on this throne made of antlers. Mm-hmm. And this head orc says, every month we host a big party. We get everybody drunk and we feed them and party together with one rule, no guns. And every year we have peace. But this year, who brings the guns? You two motherfuckers come in and disrespect the celebration. It's you, the police, to bring the guns. And this orc over here, he isn't even blooded. So then the orcs just start beating the shit out of Will Smith and Nick the Orc even more as they are demanding to know where the wand is. 
But they don't tell him, though. Also, he gives this whole song and dance about how he came from Miami and everything was good there and he wasn't in the life and he just wants a little piece of it. And then he's like, all right, I'm going to kill all of you. And he like looks for the wand in the bag that Tika has, can't find it. So he asks his son... Mikey, come up here. But Mikey, my boy, today you get your colors. Come up here and commit murder. Show me how big man you are. And this whole time we've seen Mikey amongst the, the Orkin gangbangers. And he's been uh, darting his eyes around and looking all sheepish. And he walks up to the front and he says, Pop, I can't kill this orc because he's what the orc what saved my life when I was spray painting in the alley that day. Talk about a turn of good luck, Bo right coinky dinks abound and then as soon as this kid says this nick the orc looks at will smith and to the dummies in the audience and goes hey that's the guy that i let go in the alleyway earlier during the flashback (laughs) remember when we talked about that and you saw the whole sepia thing and i talked over it that's the guy him look over there do you think he looks like the guy who shot you see it's not me that's why I got to hurt him, because he's a kind of a big guy, and I had to boost him up to the ladder and everything. Hey, wait, Will Smith, since I saved that kid's life, guess what? They're probably going to let us go. <laughs> and the main orc is like, look, Mikey, you can't be part of this. Go on out of here. See you later. I'll, I'll see you at home. All right, Pops, I'll see you later. All right, give me that gun. And Nick's like, oh, maybe he's going to give me a gun as a prize for saving his son. <laughs> And instead, he just shoots Nick through the chest and shoves him tumbling into this deep pit. Yeah, that goes to Middle Earth or whatever. And at that point, I was like, what? You just killed one of our two principals? Oh, wait, there's magic in this movie. Shit. And so Tika pulls the wand out of her arm. It comes out of nowhere, yeah. man. I don't know where Tika had this thing. I'm just hoping she didn't watch that remake of Chainsaw Massacre, is all I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Because it would have been in her vagina where that lady hid the gun. And Tika just gives it a little <laughs> mecha leka hi, mecha honey ho. And uh-huh. up drifts Nick the Orc, who's surrounded by light, and all of a sudden he's alive again. He's Orc Jesus. Right. And this Orc shaman is like, oh, this is a prophecy. And then everyone kneels to Nick. Mm-hmm. And Will Smith just grabs Tika, who now has black veiny stuff spreading on her neck and whatnot, and grabs Nick the Orc and is like, we gotta go. <laughs> and so they leave. And that's the end of the scene. Like, this whole dramatic scene is just, hey, we brought him back to life. Everyone is astounded by this. And yeah. then they just walk out of there. Once outside, Will Smith says, Tika, you're a bright? That would have been fucking good to know. You're going to need to unfuck this as some shit. That's actual dialogue. Mm -hmm. And then Tika, who can now speak English because we need her to have dialogue in the movie. Tika says, the elves hunting you are working for the Dark Lord who wants to slaughter billions and enslave them and others to usher in a new age of dark magic. Let me narrate a flashback scene to explain. Watch closely. (laughs) <laughs> Leela sent an assassin back to kill me, because, but I was protected by the shield of light or something. That assassin was Larika. We did parkour, and she dropped a magic wand, and I got it. And then I stuck her in a wall with magic gluing wings on the left and the right. Leela cannot get her wand back. If she does, she can restore the Dark Lord's powers. What does any of that mean? We're almost at the end of this movie. I, I have no idea what she's talking about. None of it matters to the the conclusion of this film is the thing. No. So she says, oh, I'm dying. Please promise to keep the wand from Layla. And they're like, yeah, that's fine. We got to get out of here. You need to take me back to my home. There's a little pool there and it has a tree going next to it. Take me there and I can live. And Will Smith says, nah, we're going to take you to the hospital. <laughs> right. And then we're going to turn the wand over to the feds, which earlier was what he said he didn't want to do right like it's completely inconsistent well, oh there's a big one coming up but we'll get to that in a second so nick the orc is like oh listen uh will smith we can't do this but let me tell you a little story about an unblooded orc farmer <laughs> who brought together the nine armies together and then there was a prophecy any of this mm-hmm. landing with you at all can we just go back to the crime scene now his name is jirak and he was unblooded like me he was a farmer and he united the orcs and he fulfilled a great prophecy maybe that's like me maybe Maybe we're in a prophecy. Look around. I think we're in a prophecy. And Will Smith is like, look at my face. This is not a prophecy face. This is, I'm having a bad night face. Oh, Will Smith, pretty please. And he's like, all right, fine. Let's go back. So they go back to the crime yeah, scene. Yeah, go back to where we started. Will Smith, as they're going through, pockets one of the bombs from this like storehouse of weapons. Nick the Orc does say, hey. 
that's a bomb. <laughs> Which, clearly, it's a bomb. It's got wires and shit sticking out of it. Yeah. It's got like a little clock face on the front that's counting down backward or something. It's scribbled on the front, TNT, a.k.a. bomb. Meanwhile, hidden under the table from which they steal this bomb is Agent 47, who just seems to be hiding out there. All our bad elves just show up. So they go to this pool where they're the roots of the great tree that or tied to whatever in the hood at this crime scene tika starts screaming for them to shoot through the walls because they're coming and so there are shotguns and gunfights and more fighting ensues right the highlights are the lady in fernie gets killed by nick strapping the bomb to her and then he shoves her out the window where she's hanging by her feet from some wire or something and nick the orc goes hey I gave her the bomb. And we're like, we know. We just saw you do it in the movie. And he's like, you know what bombs do? They explode. Let's watch what happens. Do you have a dry erase board or something I can explain the <laughs> physics of all this? All right, look, right here. This is me. <laughs> and then I gave her the bomb. Now I'm going to draw this long line. Now at the bottom, I'm drawing another version of her. Let me erase the first version. And she still has the bomb. And she's dangling down there. That's you can look over there. You can see her. Now here, <laughs> she got the bomb. And then the bomb would explode. So let's see what happens. Yeah, and it does. It blows her up real good. Uh Uh-huh. And the Agent 47 dude just gets shot in the chest with a shotgun. He gets stabbed with a foosball rod. Mm -hmm. The one that has the little people attached to it that you spin around to whack the ball in his shoulder. And at first I was like, is that how you kill an elf? Just you stab him with a foosball rod? Mm -hmm. Like a vampire with a wooden stake? That's right. That'd be pretty good. Yeah. Layla is attacking Will Smith and he ends up getting her kind of tied up around a refrigerator he bangs her on the head a few times with the freezer door that was pretty funny also Layla just took out an entire SWAT team and all of Poison's gangbangers that were triple strapped how is it that she just can't rip the arms off Will Smith and call it a day is beyond me well he's you know blessed Chad when they're fighting at this refrigerator did you happen to notice what was inside it Mm -mm. there's like all kinds of pudding snack packs and a whole bunch of spaghetti sauce in jars who shops for this place nine-year-old child oh I could go for a pudding snack right now Chad (laughs) I'm not going to lie to you. Like one of those that's like chocolate on top and then caramel in the middle and then chocolate on the bottom. That'd be delicious right now. Oh, well, they're having this fight at the fridge. Tika, wait, is she in the pool? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's just laying in the pool. Yeah, Tika's in the pool. And then... Nick shoots Layla. Tika blasts Layla with magic from the wand. Yeah. Which makes her vulnerable. And then Nick the Orc shoots Layla. And you think that she's dead, but she's not. She's going to come back in a minute. And then Agent 47, the elf, he's dead maybe. Who cares? It doesn't matter. Right. Will Smith then takes Tika back to the glowing pool of water near the tree of something something. And then over by the fridge, Layla comes back to life. And as Will Smith lowers Tika into the water to save her, Will Smith says, so, yo, like, now what? And Tika says, oh, have faith, Will Smith. By the way, she's coming back. And then Layla sneaks up behind Nick the Orc, wraps a wire around his head because she saw the little dry erase board schematic that he did earlier (laughs) for elf number three. And she just tosses him off this ledge and hangs him by his neck. Okay. And then... Layla jumps down and grabs her wand, which I was like, oh, shit, Layla's got the wand. Things are about to really pop Right, here off. comes the Dark Lord for our finale. Right, no. Layla just goes into the pool, and she gets real intimate with Tika, which, are they sisters? The, right, or they s- are sisters, yeah. as it happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Layla gets up close, and she kisses her and talks to her about living and dying and eternity or whatever. And then she just chunks Layla out of the pool, and then Layla flies out of the pool on her own powers and lands on the ledge above and will smith shouts out what are you and layla says i am a priestess i am a warrior i am a picker and grinner lover and sinner joker smoker midnight talker i am the space cowboy but some people call me maurice because i am the pompatus of love Woo-hoo. i am whatever my dark lord needs me to be Meanwhile, Nick is recovering. Yeah, he lets himself loose from the wire that he was hanging from. And he gets his shotgun back. And right before Layla can zap Will Smith with the wand that she's got, Nick the Orc fires and, Look out, I'm about to disarm you. And he shoots the wand out of her hand. And right. Will Smith says, hey, if you meant to shoot the wand out of her hand, that's great. Mission accomplished. Shoot her in the head. Oh, okay. Hold on a second. Let me shoot her again. Click. Hey, wait a minute. I pulled the trigger and nothing happened. I'm out of bullets. Like he says that after pulling the trigger. It's real dumb. <laughs> Will Smith in the move that I suspected was going to happen from literally the beginning of the movie. <laughs> 
first frame of the film. Yeah. It really started with, hey, it, there's one in a million. If you grab the wand, if you're not a bright, it explodes. And it's like, oh, so Will Smith is going to find out he's a bright when he tries to sacrifice himself. And that's exactly what happens here because he grabs the wand to blow himself and Layla up. And instead, the wand turns red and he doesn't die. And we realize, oh, he's a bright after all. How about this? screenwriters you don't say that one in a million humans are brights leave that out completely you say if any human touches this they will explode mm-hmm. and then you have ike Barinholtz and all his racist selfish cops like i don't believe that you know that's just what they say they're gonna go down their ill-gotten path therefore when will smith grabs the wand as you say it is a moment of sacrifice that he's gonna blow everybody up and himself to prevent maybe something bad happen i mean he's called the dark lord but i mean i like dark chocolate I think it's better than milk chocolate. Mm -hmm, I agree. It doesn't make it bad, but it is viewed more as an act of sacrifice. And then when he doesn't blow up, you're like, oh, what's going on here? Will Smith has this special power. He's like Harry Potter. Right. Just older. Much, much older. When he's got the wand now, he's like, well, what do I do with it? And Tika says, you want to say Vikramas? And he's like, uh, Vikramas? And it just blasts Layla. Mm -hmm. blows her up it's the like kind of thing that we saw earlier in the movie where it just reduces her to cinders kind of thing and she flies off completely destroyed one presumes and also it creates this fireball explosion that goes up and lets the feds know we've been following fireballs all night here's another what's over there yeah quick To the fireball. You hear someone yell in the ADR, which I find funny. Hey, they've got a bride inside. (laughs) And so Nick comes running out of this building on fire. And he's like, hey, wait a second. Where's Will Smith in the Tika? And he looks around, sees that there's no Will Smith. He's like, oh, no, I left him inside. I got to go back. And so he runs back inside. (laughs) And ends up like finding will smith he drags him out they collapse on top of one another and will smith is like thanks for saving me hey look over there across the street to some conveniently placed orcs Uh who they saw him pull will smith out of a birdie building so they one of them like cuts his hand and holds it up and this is the blooded thing to let uh, yeah, him know that he is now a blooded orc he came back to life if he's orc jesus or something and now this sure why not okay here's the one line that legitimately made me laugh in the movie is oh, will, will smith saying hey nick look there are firemen here we should have been firemen and nick the is like yeah we should have been firemen Anyway, here's another inconsistency that that we talked about. They just abandoned the wand. Like this whole thing that they've been trying to keep out of the hands of dirty cops and all this stuff. They have just totally forgotten about this. Yeah. And we see that the magic task force has shown up with some kind of containment box for said wand. Yeah. And our heroes are being taken to the hospital. When they're laying on the ground before they get taken to the hospital, Will Smith says, yo, you're still not my friend and fuck magic. And then Nick the Orc goes, I think it's kind of cool. I don't know. I think magic is pretty fun. Like, I, I brought me back to life. I thought that was pretty cool. Will Smith, look over here. Pick a card. Not that one. Pick a different one. <laughs> we cut to a hospital where Will Smith and Nick the Orc are recovering. The feds show up and Nick the Orc spouts off a stream of details that pretty much detail the entire movie in about 30 seconds. So if you want to watch this, skip to the end and listen to him babble on for a while. And I think it's it's meant to be funny i'm pretty sure it's meant to be funny but it's not and then finally will smith just interrupts nick the orc and he says don't say shit i still can't get a grasp on nick the orc's character because sometimes he's a goof other times he's this sad sack i I don't know finally joaquin phoenix and john goodman jr they're standing there they tell nick the orc to shut up and then will smith just steps in and he says look we didn't see shit shit didn't happen and that's what happened gangbangers killed some cops no matter Magic was used or seen or even thought about. And I'm a liar, and that's the truth. The end. Mm -hmm. Fuck y'all. And then the feds are like, sounds good to us. See you later. The thrust of the movie is Nick saying like, oh, yeah, what he said. That's what happened. All those lies he just said, that's what happened. (laughs) There's a ceremony where the mayor... I guess, is honoring Uh Will Smith and Nick the Orc. And there's a bunch of pictures of the fallen cops, including Rodriguez, and also all of the cops that Will Smith shot. (laughs) 
and he's like, you know, it really chaps my ass that we're standing in front of all these dirty cops that I killed with Rodriguez. <laughs> and Nick the Orc is like, hey, don't worry about it, Will Smith. We know what happened. And I'll tell everybody because, you know, I can't keep a secret or nothing. Did you see what happened in the last scene? I'll tell everybody that ass. I don't worry. Uh, that's on your surprise party tomorrow. Oh, shit. Forget I said that. Oh, and so Will Smith's wife and kid are in the crowd. I just saw the kid. I didn't see his wife. Yeah, so she's there. And we also see Tika kind of wandering through the crowd a little bit. It, which is crazy because you totally forget about her the whole movie. Until she shows back up. And you're like, oh yeah, she's in the movie. Then we see a fairy fly towards the screen with its hideous face and let out a shriek. <laughs> and then, yeah. You think they would have called the sequel too bright? Like <laughs> T-O-O bright or the number too bright? Too bright, too furious. We discussed this a little bit up front. The biggest problem with this movie, I think, is that it poses more questions than it could possibly answer. And so the story that it is telling doesn't feel satisfying because it raises all this Dark Lord stuff that it doesn't address. And the other questions like seeing the dragon in the background and this centaur cop and all this stuff. It's like uh, that stuff is more interesting we just don't get any resolution to any of it. I can't believe I'm going to say this, but I think that RIPD did a better job of mashing up like a fantasy world and the real world than this did. Because it played the ridiculous part of it as really over the top. I think you could have made this movie and kind of ground it even more and just more tightly weave together the magic and the reality. I mean, I think your intro really hit on it as far as whether it's the noir aspect or that a lot of these characters either one already understand the world better and can more effectively communicate it to the audience or as i mentioned earlier if you were to take will smith and sort of put him in a situation where he has to be teamed up with this orc cop and doesn't know their world very often therefore he is one of our principal characters but he's also that character in the movie who's constantly asking questions and understanding this other culture or magical elements that he may not have exposure mm -hmm. to yeah you just need somebody to ask the questions that the audience has because everyone in this movie knows more about the world than the audience does and you need that person that's just going to ask the dumb question i think it could have been more fun and less gritty yeah. to where if you know if you'd had somebody in the police station saying look we've got to get somebody on dragon task force this is becoming a problem or whatever else you know they're staying in the hill like those kind of things oh you just sort of pepper in some of these moments that you feel like this is a more of a magical world than it is a real this just feels like the real world and we've just quietly sprinkled in a little bit of all this nonsense yeah. address the stuff the stuff that you get glimpses of would be better if you just don't show it really this is one of the few examples where a tell don't show might actually be useful of like when they're giving out all, all the car assignments like you said of like you're on dragon duty today and you've got to go clean up a troll spill and stuff like that where you play it as a little more whimsical how about this? Get rid of the use of the word fuck. How about mm. this? Don't send your two principals into titty bars where you see full frontal female nudity. None of that belongs in this movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can do the police stuff without it being overly gritty. It needs to be more rush hour and less training day. Can you believe that those words are coming out of your mouth? In the grand tradition of Pick 6 movies of we make your movie less worse. Right. Then, yeah, you lighten the tone of this thing up a little bit. It doesn't have to go full goofy like R.I.P.D., but you can absolutely do something that is not grim. Make Nick the Orc your dry heavy. Let Will Smith have a little bit more fun. And you go from there. Do him like a Drax character because of his cultural differences or whatever. That yeah. he doesn't understand sarcasm and he takes everything too literally. And he comes That's from it. this warrior clan. Like almost like war from Star Trek. Yes. You know, that kind of character. And then you have Will Smith bouncing off this rigid, stiff kind of character who is unintentionally funny. It's not that hard. We made your movie less worse already. So, Chad, what movie can we make less worse next? W or in you know, weeks? Bo, we've done two Netflix originals, mm -hmm. and I thought it would be kind of fun to head over to Amazon Prime and see what they have to offer. So, next, we are going to take a look at a superhero movie. Ooh. I don't know if you've seen one of those recently or not, Bo, but this one stars Sylvester Stallone as the Samaritan. 
Is it any good? Probably not. I don't know. I haven't seen it, but it looks terrible. Also, I don't think we've done a Sylvester Stallone movie on this podcast, have we? No, we did Cliffhanger. That's right. Yeah, yeah. We did Cliffhanger. I forgot about that. Is that it? Yeah, yeah. that's our only one. So, okay. It's like, how could we come this far and not done a Sylvester Stallone movie? But he will be back. And in this one, he's a little bit older. He's a lot of bit older. He's hopefully a little bit wiser. And he's playing a superhero. So imagine if you took Shaquille O'Neal in Steel and you you mashed it up with Rocky Balboa. That's what I'm hoping for because I haven't seen this movie yet. So I've got my work cut out for me between now and the next time uh, we release an episode. How could this be good? Is what I ask. It, oh, it can't. It, it can't be good. <laughs> <laughs> Guaranteed to be a real bummer of a movie. But we will make it a little less work. I was just going to start asking questions about this movie, about how maybe it is going to be like an old man superhero. I'm curious how old Sylvester Stallone allows himself to be in this movie. Very old. Right. You would think. They're not de-aging him for this. How could you? Why would you? You know what? <laughs> right. You're old. Just be an old man. Yeah, right. But I think it's going to be one of those situations like Robert Downey Jr. on the ass end of those Avengers movies where he essentially just stood in front of a green screen and darted his head around while a CGI Iron Man suit flip-flopped and beat up bad guys. Like, he didn't do anything. Have one of those theme park fans in front of his yeah. face. He's like, hey, look yeah. at this. I'm flying around. That's pretty much what I'm expecting. Like, you don't have to do shit and we can make you look like a acrobatic crime fighting superstar matinee idol once again hey oh so. look at these robots i gotta punch right in the face and they'll come <laughs> apart like little nuts and bolts you've already made it a little less worse <laughs> <laughs> so come back and see us in two weeks time as we talk about the samaritan here on pick six movie and this see, season 23's theme stream on <laughs> As always, like, rate, review. You can email us at pick6movies at gmail.com. If you have a recommendation for the back end of the season, email us and let us know. We still have one slot that is wide open at the time of this recording, so we would love to hear if you have a movie that you would like to see reviewed on this particular podcast. Bo, any final thoughts that you have on Bright? Hey, you know, you can make a Bright 2 without Will Smith. I bet just Nick the work and maybe that giant guy. And you know, we just hang out and maybe have some Jersey Mike subs. Hey, let me just ask you, like, you consider yourself to be, like, you're a boy, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. Are you, like, are, you, are you, you a proud boy? Well, uh, yeah. I, you know, that seems to have a bad connotation these days. I, I heard you got pulled into the clan, right? Hey, you may need to have a talk, all right? Oh, boy. Maybe Brad Dewey has such a good idea now that I think about it. Are you, are you on 4chan? 8chan? 16chan? Just get me on the chan. Anything but Jackie Chan. Or Chan is on the back, you know. We'll see you in two weeks time, everybody. Oh.